are we doing? Are we are we, we, we talking about all these uh, related things? Yeah, we we we're just waiting for Leah, and um, yeah, in the meantime, we we're chatting. We can edit this front bit off, but um, I bet it's interesting to leave it on. <laughs> I was just going to say just, that uh, I understood Gary's um, point about labels being shortcuts. Um, so it's easier to just use a term, but it is freeing to not think of, you know, as Lord Hugh says, not to think of ourselves as just one, one thing, but because, um, even I took like <clears throat> a long time ago, a psychology class, psychology 11, not even 101. And the teacher said that one of our challenges as a human being is that we always like to be consistent so we define ourselves as something and then we we think something's wrong with us if we're not consistently that way but but i uh, do see okay, labels so, so, wait, wait, wait i've got to get in there because because uh, you you you've you've covered so much ground i won't be able to collect it again so do you mind if i start answering and then you carry oh, on oh no please go ahead okay so just just go back to what you said there i said basically it's a label is a shortcut okay so so now what's being cut it's basically there to save time right so basically yes to save time yeah so basically for chronos for the sake of the sidereal clock right moloch <laughs> you have cut things short it's a castration narrative again it's saying if i cut this it's procrustean right Procru you know what procrustes did made a frame yes said, now i'm going to cut off the excess so it fits in the frame so I take the externalities out, I simplify oh, yeah. things, and I put it in a frame. Why? So that I can move on in time. I can save time. We want to destroy time. Yes, but I was just now coming what, from what, the point of it's so prevalent because of the culture in which we live, you yes. know, um, so, in, in so the office, the at point. work, at, you yeah, know, in that's school. That's the other point. Of, remember, wait, wait, I've got to get this in because uh, otherwise I'll, I'll, I won't be able, I'll miss it. And that's so damned important. These psychologists are the enemy. They are telling you that people have labels so that, uh, what did you say? It was very important. Uh, we like being consistent. Consistent, yeah. So, so they are telling you how to be a slave. Like all slaves are under the clock and they're telling you to be consistent. So basically they need you to be consistent. Consistent means regular. Controllable. Means, you know, exactly. If you're random, they can't control you. So important part of a slave system is making sure that you're predictable. You can say in advance what you're going to do. If you're random and haphazard, you're uncontrollable. So everything is reciprocal. Everything controlled is reciprocal. Artificial intelligence. Everything will have a clock or some kind of reciprocator, a governor. Even a steam engine has a governor. They have these cogs. And basically, they're all cyclical. They're cyclical because they're regular, and they're regular so they can be controlled. That's why they indoctrinate kids at school for the clock, and that's why they try and get them, say, these are how long classes are, mustn't be late. All of these things are to reinforce regularity. Why? So they can, they can be parasites off the back of you. you can't, it's very hard to be parasitic or make a living out of something irregular and unpredictable. Even yep. casinos don't do that. The art of doing a casino is getting the randomness out of the picture secretly somehow. But they have to get uh, the randomness out. You can't run a casino if it really was random because <laughs> one day you might just be bust. So, so those psychologists are telling you that you must be consistent and subtly reinforcing that message. Why? So you can be productive. Why do they need you productive? Because somebody's living off your back. Yeah, thanks so for that you clarification. Must label yourself, right? Yes. yes. Thanks. Okay, so so go on. So thanks. Uh, I really needed to get that out because it was. Yeah, so yeah. No, no. I I see that, yeah, and on. it's great. And I even really like the way um, you responded to Marty about. Because we do tend to label ourselves that I am this one thing. I am gay, but uh, well, now you <laughs> it's know just why. one thing. It's just now based you know on one one behavior. One behavior, you know. Um, 
even at work, um, it, you know, like you can say a person, it's not a judgment on the person. It's like they're doing something. They have a behavior, but they're not, they're not lazy all the time. They're not this all the time. It's just that they're doing something that's not acceptable for the standards that you have. But I do see a, a just a tangent. I do see a way of undermining um, um, Kronos with what you said, that at meetings, instead of me just using abbreviations and labels, I could belabor the point and spell out everything that I'm saying, and that will just uh, <laughs> prolong meetings. So that'll be a way of undermining. Yeah, I mean, we live in Rome and you got to do as the Romans do. You don't want to make a religion out of any of the stuff that I'm telling you either. But it's just a way of thinking. So I'm telling you from the part of my ancestry that's kind of Brahmin and aristocratic. And I must tell you, that's not a boast. Aristocrats are almost identical to the bottom rung of the working class. They kind of... Aristocrats are, are degenerates, and uh, they, in this, from the cultural point of view, I mean, they they're not degenerates from our hunter-gatherer ancestors. They're probably closer to hunter-gatherers than than that, the middle class, but the but very top and the very bottom are very similar and very dysfunctional looking. And one of the things that aristocrats, uh, particularly my dad and stuff, they have an ethos of not labeling themselves. So, so you know, really, really rebelling against it. My grandfather would, you know, wouldn't fill out a form if he was forced to fill out a form. Um, and this is something that's you know passed down to aristocrats. It's basically forms are for the hoi polloi. They're for basically the the slaves. And so when he got to you know when it became impossible not to fill out forms, like when he he went on a ship or something like that and he had you know past customs you know he used to have free borders up until the beginning of the 20th century but eventually after world war one they started changing shit and really knuckling down mm -hmm. and eventually you had to do a form just to travel you had to come and then it got kind of strict but he would he would like fuck around with it i mean you didn't have to present a passport in those days you just put a false name yeah basically the all I know people today. I had somebody on my yacht um, a couple of years ago, and she's one of these freaking Brahmins from the UK, and she has a fucking traveling name with a fucking passport and everything because her dad is somebody I won't mention in, in the UK. And I couldn't believe it. I thought that era had gone, but she literally had a fucking traveling name. When I, you know, on a boat, you have to have a crew list and <laughs> do, you have to know people's names, take their passports and stuff because the Coast Guard can board you. I'll be in trouble if I, if I didn't manage the ship properly. But I couldn't believe it. She has a full on U UK passport with a false name. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? Is That's my traveling name. I thought, like, my fucking grandfather had a traveling name. He'd just use any old fucking name. And then, you know, when he put down profession, he would say gentleman. Wow. Say, yeah. And basically, my dad used to do that. And, you know, I, I've done it. In fact, just taking the piss. You have to do this. If you're an American citizen, you have to, you have this little blue card when you arrive. I don't know if they still make you do that. Yeah, they do, actually. Americans have to. And they have basically say what you've been doing abroad. You know, how much money are you bringing in? <laughs> I would just fill it out with. No oh, shit, I better not say that because I, <laughs> I can't be on record saying that because uh, I think that's probably felony territory. But anyway, I've been doing this. There was some guy doing that, and they just basically filled out, you know, what's your profession in that? And the, the guy might just say, a oh, gentleman. <laughs> it's like, and, you know, maybe they were never called on it. The guys just collect those blue forms and go, fuck, <laughs> check it in the bin. The, a lot of it's these things really, they, they really require exactly. you. People comply, right? Voluntarily, they don't know that you can't. Yeah, I re always first read what are the consequences of disobeying this this form and stuff. And if they say, "Oh, that's pretty light," <laughs> then I'm not full of crap. <laughs> uh, someone joined. Is it Leah? No. H. 
Oh, Hans. Oh, oh, hi, Hans. Yeah, I think I know who you are. Hi. So, Hans, we're waiting for yeah. Uh, um, Leah, Leah Keith, and uh, we're going to interview about uh, Deep Green Lies, which is a book she's just written with Derek Jensen. And I'm not sure who the third author is. I don't really know that guy very well. Who's the third man? Oh, um, let's see. Wilbur or something, is it? Yeah. Wilbur? Wilbur. I looked yeah, it up and now I've forgotten it. Yeah, I forgot. Too. He was in the know. video that Mike linked to. Yeah. yeah, in the video. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, Aaron I always kind of think of it. Um, you see, oh, it's upside oh. down. Eric McBain. Ar oh, deep no, green no, resistance. that's deep green. Another I mean, that's deep green yeah. resistance. But it's the same. It's the same. I think it's the same guy. No. Oh no, it's the other no, one. Was in the, no, no. It's the other one was in the video. You're right. You're right. You're right. This yeah. the other one that was in the video. No, You're right. No, Eric McBain. I'm 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 familiar with, but I'm, yeah, I don't yeah. really know this other guy. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. We're we're waiting for the waiting for Goddard. I honestly don't think she'll show at this point. Um, or man, I don't know. I'm sorry, guys. Well, I must have got ah. this time going wrong or something. I mean, maybe she'll come by ten thirty. She didn't. I don't know. But we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. What what the hell should we do? Should should we should we pack this in and start at the at the regular meeting time or should we just carry on yeah, with it? I think we should just carry on. We're all here. But at half okay. past, at, at the later time, there'll be Ryan and maybe others who will join the other meeting. So yeah. um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, they'll, they'll drop in here anyway. Yeah. So anyway, I guess any if, if people want to drop off and go and do something else and come back or something, yeah. otherwise we yeah. can just carry on and start. But I mean, since we're recording, we might as well start, right? Start. Okay. Yeah. Well, Gary, Gary, you had started something interesting about um, awakening, and you know, uh, and you said it would be long, but maybe you could continue on that thing because we had that conversation last night, and I was wondering a bit more about it. I, w I wanted to to hear what everybody was had to say about this. Oh, Gary, you're muted. You're muted. Gary, you're muted. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm waffling and nobody can hear me. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Hugh, I want to... Uh, I want, we, uh, in fact, I spoke to you about it the other day. This is a discussion about um, uh, questions regarding enlightenment. Um, and uh, a friend of mine I was having a discussion with, um, and uh, I, uh, I'll just give you that little bit, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to a little story. Um, this fellow I was talking to uh, doesn't know much about Lord Hugh apart from what I've told him, and I was describing to him how Lord Hugh's take on the... the uh, psychotic break um, and the difference between the breakdown and the breakthrough or the malpsychosis and the eupsychosis. And I was describing all that to him. And uh, as I waffled on, he stopped me partway into the conversation and asked me why I was wasting my time trying to do something that I'd already done. And it kind of stopped me in my tracks because I have no idea whether this fellow is an enlightened person or not. He's a very enigmatic person. I've known him for a long time, but I, I seriously wonder how serious how seriously I take him at times. But he did cast my line of thought down a different pathway regarding the question of spiritual enlightenment. Now, I'll leave that part of it just sitting there for the moment. I won't continue with that little part. And then I was trying to work out how I could present this as a discussion with Lord Hugh. And in doing that, uh, I wanted to just give a little Zen story. Um, imagine that, that uh, you know, you're somewhere in medieval Japan maybe and, you know, there's this t traditional Zen, whatever they call them, um, Dosha, what, what's the what's the word? I don't know the, the name of the ones. 
Ashram? Ashram, but they didn't call it that. It's a dosho or so. A, a zendo. Yeah, a zendo. A dojo, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so a disciple comes along to this particular zendo and says to the master, or not a disciple, but an aspirant, I guess you could say, and says to the master, hey, you know, uh, w- will you take me on as a, as a uh, as an acolyte or a disciple here? Um, and uh, for a start, something's happening right at the beginning, is that in my experience, these masters never say that they're enlightened. They just don't make a statement about that kind of thing. It's it's just not really... Her- they might describe some kind of profound experience they've had earlier in life, but generally, you've never said you're enlightened. I don't know of any other spiritual teacher I've come across, except for people who are obviously into the macchio bit, but they, ju- they don't make statements like that. So for a start, this, uh, this acolyte is arriving at the Zendo. He's, he is assuming that this guy's enlightened and he wants to try and get a bit piece of the action, uh, but the master has never actually confirmed that and he's never going to. Um, so anyway, that's the first part. The sec- the, so the disciple stays there for years and years, and uh, at some point, uh, just for the sake of this little story, we'll assume that at some point this disciple has an awakening. Okay, he wakes up. And I think the second thing that would happen at that point is that the master's not going to tell him that that's happened. Uh, he, he's not. He's not. He will notice it, and he will know for sure. But they, uh, my feeling is that he would. He wouldn't say anything to dis- the disciple, and I don't think any other master would either, as a general thing, say to them. And in fact. I think it could even go further, is that the master could then uh, deliberately string the disciple along and, and, and kind of try and phase him, hoax him, you know. It, it, it's like treat him as though nothing's changed at all, as though he's still the, the disciple and everything's going on and, and there's been no shift and, and, you know, I'll give you your koam once a week or whatever the hell they do and your duties and all the rest of it. And there's no, nothing at all. And the end process, stop smiling, the end process is that the disciple's got to know this for himself independently, that if he's woken up, that that's for him to find out. It's not for somebody else to tell him because that that is another little trap as well, a dependency thing, I guess, that's going on. Um, And... so this rela- do, do you mind if I go on for a bit longer, or have I been? Sh- I, I, I want to go to part no, two. No, go on. Are yeah, you go okay? On. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what I want to go is to part two. The first story was the Zen story. Okay. The second story is a contemporary story in in the times that we are now, and in in the times that we are now, uh, we live in a world and a society that absolutely doesn't recognise this thing called spiritual awakening or whatever words you want to use for it. It just doesn't know anything about it. If it, 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 it can't register it, it has no context for it. It's got no place for it, no use for it. It's, it's, it's. So if you're, if you are somebody who, for some reason or other, did happen to wake up in the midst of a society like this, you would be in a kind of a parallel position to that disciple in the Zendo, where you, you might have felt something go on. But when you look around you, everybody else is just po-faced and, and they're, they're, you've got no, uh, um, how can I put it, you've got no, nothing's coming back at you. Like, you know, nobody's acknowledging that anything at all has occurred to you whatsoever. And you might think that, oh, well, I've just, just, um, it's just me. I'm being, I'm a little bit strange. I'm a little bit idiosyncratic, something like that. Um, uh, and, but then... The next phase of this little stage is that we also live in a society where there's a spiritual marketplace, and this person might find their way into that spiritual mas- uh, marketplace, and so I'll, I'll go along to a you know um, whatever anybody Eckhart Tolle will do uh, go along there. This guy he works for years listening to to Eckhart, you know, and thinks thinks to himself, but I, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm, I haven't broken through. This is just ridiculous um, because he hasn't realised that it already happened to him, but the society kind of hoaxed him out of the idea, didn't give him any way of having a perspective. 
I'm explaining this badly. He didn't end up getting a perspective on himself that enabled him to know where he was at. So he assumed that he wasn't where it at and kept on trying to drink a glass of water that he that he'd already drunk, which is a futile exercise. Now, uh, I think you now then I'll stop there. That's the end of that second story, I guess. Just that's enough of it. Uh, Michael and I were having a little bit of an exchange recently. It was only just a sentence or two touching on this matter where I think we both felt that there was a possibility that something had occurred, but uh, um, we we didn't really know it for ourselves. And the other thing is nobody else, uh, could anybody else be, be uh, how can I put it? Could anybody else be trusted to tell us, I guess, is, is, is how it is. But, yeah, and so now I'll just leave that again and go to the next bit, which is, in dealing with Lord Hugh, and you dropped a bit of a bombshell uh, because last week when I challenged you about, uh, I said to you regarding the HSPs, that that uh, was there another way to go through, you know, was Hugh, Lord Hugh's ego-cracking um, method the only, and, and you you predictably would admit of nothing else, uh, you know, and I'm, 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 it's okay, I'm not down on you or anything. Um, this is not what this discussion is about. It, you know, I'm just, I won't really want to explore this. Um, is, that was okay. Uh, I, I mean, I could see where you're coming from, you know, uh, but I was very surprised that under episode 34, which was the recording of that meeting, there was a comment that came on, a fellow called, um, oh, God, I don't know. It, um, yeah, uh, he um, he said too much, a fellow called he said too much, H-E-C-E. And he's he basically was taking my side or Sophia my side in in that in his comment. He said, you know, there's another way to do it. Now you replied, well, touche, yes, but but the time's late. I think your point was basically that because the time's late, you have to use a pretty tough me method to wake people up. Um, because you can't put, you said, you, in fact, you use the word, we're not, I don't want to pussyfoot around because the time is, is getting late. You, you, want, you want to go sort of straight for the throat and start strangling this, this thing. Um, but um, I, I, at first, well, I think there was, a, there was something there too because um, I could see that in not agreeing with me during the meeting, you were doing two things. One was you were putting forward that point of view that, yes, that was the more appropriate method for the times we're living in. But I think, too, also uh, you were still simultaneously engaging in a little ego destruction episode in case I was attached to that particular idea. You wanted to knock out that bit of my ego that was hanging on to it. Um, and so I could, I, I began to see that that my impression is that you operate, you're not just doing one thing at once. You're actually being very sophisticated. I don't know whether it's conscious or whether it just comes out, but um, but you're often being multi-pronged in the in in the, the things you're doing are operating at more in more than one way and dealing with more than one aspect at at each time. Um, and. Uh, yeah, look, basically, I'll stop there because I guess you probably want to say something at this point. So I can't tell absolutely what your internal state is, but I can guess. And so I know for from from what you've said that you've had a peak experience. So now uh, is that still enlightenment? So the in uh, the you know, a very sensitive person kind of thing. Um, it what I was doing there was is trying to get you to dissociate. So, so I detect that basically you're not dissociating. So the part of the sensitivity, I mean, there it's it's kind of brutal because I know that you're feeling sensory overload and kind of uh, sensory pain. It's like looking at the light and you, you really, your eyes are hurting and it's that kind of pain. But still, you know, because I'm the one shining the, the light in your eyes, it's painful for me. But the, the reason I did it is because uh, to get you to dissociate. So it's the same thing that 
any cult leader would would do. In fact, it's any uh, uh, pedophile would do it. Uh, it's um, it's a thing they do in the military and stuff. And see, if you if you traumatize particularly a child, the only avenue of response, uh, particularly in like sexual molestation or sexual assault, um, a, a lot of uh, pimps and stuff will do this with a hooker is you get a young girl and if you if you rape her or sexually assault her you mentally she only has one way to go and that's to dissociate from the experience it's a traumatic experience and then you know it's kind of like a near-death experience you can do that by putting somebody on the spot they they uh, I believe it happened to Dostoevsky they put him up in front of a firing squad with blanks that's a good way to do it but what what it it gave Dostoevsky um, an epileptic fit, and he he blacked out. Um, it's it is kind of the same as enlightenment, and I think that's the key to Dostoevsky. It, it's an intriguing case because it's almost it's almost enlightenment with a gun. Uh, somebody has done that to me in in anger, put a gun to my head, and I I. Uh, what happened was I immediately dissociated. So, so, uh, but the reason was strange, uh, and I won't really go into to that experience. But I didn't take it as I didn't feel that it was my last moment. The guy behind the gun wanted that, in a way that that saved my life. It was uh, he pulled the trigger, and the, basically the gun was empty. So that so I went through an experience like Dostoevsky. In, in earnest, in the same kind of thing like his. But I, I, I didn't fall flat and have an epileptic fit like that because I'd already done it. And uh, the, the reason I, I didn't say, I thought that, you know, basically this isn't the last moment. A strange reason why I have uh, basically precognition. And somewhere along the line, when he was holding this gun right between my eyes, then I, I thought, well, it looks like this is the end. And then I thought, well, hang on a minute. It can't be because there were so many precognition things that I haven't fulfilled. One of them, in fact, was my son. And and I thought, okay, for, it seriously looks like the story is over here. But it can't be because I, I know that there's this backlog of things that I still need to experience. And so I... I I was kind of relaxed. It, it impressed the guys so much that after that, I, they laughed and I was amazed <laughs> because I was so cool under fire, literally under fire. And so, but, okay, so, so, so that's kind of my experience in that. I must say uh, that in terms of what a guru will do and say about enlightenment is that very few masters will tell you anything about enlightenment. And the reason is that it causes an obstacle. You see, if you have an initiate that is trying to reach the goal, they haven't... Yeah, and I understand that. Yeah, yeah, so they have to yeah. get rid of that to get to the goal. And if you... No, just for... I know you understand this, but for other people, they, they will... The, what they'll try and do is they will try and mimic that experience. So they'll try and fake it as a, as a shortcut to get there. And so you don't want to basically say, this is what the experience is like, because otherwise they'll start practicing. If I said to you, well, ex explained an, an enlightenment experience, and then made some detail, you know, that like, oh, then so, such and such fell to the ground. And then they think, well, Enlightenment experience has to fall to the ground, otherwise you're not enlightened, and that's not the case. So you don't want to describe too much about it, because otherwise they will start trying to create that experience instead of doing the work that will get it to happen spontaneously. Okay, so, but in terms of how do you know whether you're awake and somebody can tell you, <laughs> now you're putting me on the spot, because, because, now, anybody that's no, no. I mean, I mean that that was actually a part I wanted to address. In, do you mind if I just talk for a second? Can I interrupt there? Or uh, okay, good, but but I'm going to go into a little yeah. stream after this. So talk, yeah. Uh, okay, all right. What a um, oh, hell. No more. You have the thoughts. You have the thought. Bring it out. Bring it out. 
yeah, I can't. What did you say? Can you just think of the last thing you said? Can you bring me back? So it was just about mimicking the experience. So yeah, people will try and face the experience or try and, you know, if, you have, if they have assumptions about the experience, yeah. they will get caught up in the peripheries of the experience and not actually experiencing it. Yeah, so no, not, what you like, said was a bit about how the, the master... The, the, so, the, the, yeah. so, so if, you, the if, master. If, you, if somebody's frigid or something and they've never had an orgasm, mm. and then mm. you say, well, you know, mm. some, a friend tries to explain to this woman or something is what an orgasm feels like, then mm. she's not going to... Yeah, yeah. No, no. In like relaxation where she'll get to an orgasm. She'll go, okay, you arch your back, you go, oh, and yeah, <laughs> stuff. Yeah, and pretty yeah. soon she'll be doing... No, no, no. no the po like, it, it, it's all right. Sorry. She'll be faking an orgasm and thinking, is that real? I don't know. I'm kind of doing the right stuff. So it's like you don't want to get to no, the No, no, no. get to the faking Yeah, yeah it's all right. I've got back to where I want to be, which is the uh, you, you, just following that. You, you said that, the, you know, the master is not, not going where you said, is not going to know whether you're enlightened or not going to say that. Um, um, and I think um, it, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. I, I mean, is it for anybody else to assess anyway? You, you know, um, so, so the master would this, say this, this is, it's unnecessary, right? So say okay, that again. But, Sorry, the master wouldn't say anything because it's unnecessary. That, that's what I'm feeling. Yeah, it's un, I, at least it's unnecessary. I, and I, um, I think it's inappropriate is probably a better word, to be honest with you. No, just, just unnecessary. You see that? Unnecessary. Uh, All right. Fair yeah, enough, yeah. Like, if there are no more questions mm. and you're sitting with somebody watching the sunset, yeah. what do you say? There's nothing. Mm. Is the master yeah. and the pupil knows... That we're looking through the same eyes, looking at the same sunset, and there's nothing to say, and each one knows <laughs> it. And then that's yeah. that. Yeah. But you see, what we never get there because you sit with a friend or something watching the sunset, and then you have to talk or ask a question, or and you never get to that moment. So we get to a certain le level of depth. And then this, the alien cortex pops in. It's a kind of a policeman, and it's saying, oh, I know where you're going. Oh, not without me. And it says, like, I want in on this party. And you say, like, like we're heading towards paradise, you fucking stupid alien cortex. And you say, no, no, not without me. I want to be in Eden as well. And you say, no, Eden is forbidden to alien cortexes. You can only get in no, I, I, without one. And so our alien cortex knows that. And as soon as people start quietening down and watching the sunset with a friend, it starts jabbering and asking questions and saying, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And what it's doing is saying, like, insert me in paradise. And they said, it's, it's, the alien cortex cannot go into paradise. It's like it said so many times in so many ways. Moses is saying, I cannot get into the promised land. You know, you, uh -huh. um, a camel, a rich man you can't get into through the eye of a needle. It's like a camel. It's very, it's it, over and over again, says you have to drop your alien cortex and drop your ego. You can't. I, I, Hugh, I think the, the, the way to put it is that. It's not an experience. In other words, you can't be there to experience this. It's an experience, it, it's, but it's, it's like it's, it's like birth. Okay, so so let me ask this. Like, so hmm. if you say, "How do you know you enlightened?" is is like, "How do you know you're alive?" When was the first time you knew you were alive? What was it like? Just describe it. I think you're muted. <laughs> you're muted. muted again. I'm sorry. It might be. It might be better if I am. Uh, you remember once when I asked you four questions, and the first two questions was were, were um, about me, and the second two were about you. And the first two questions were, "How do I know that I'm enlightened?" Um, or how how would you know? But anyway, you, you just reminded me that what you said. Go back to when I. Um, this is what I wanted to say. I mean, this is, I think this is what I was trying to get out earlier, that a person could wake up and not know it any more than they know what it was like being born. It happened, but you don't have a memory of it or you, you haven't got this mm, sense of having gone through that experience. 
Well, okay. I'm sorry, I might be missing your point. I don't know what you're trying let's, to get at. Let's expand it a bit. So, 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 okay. So, how do you know you're alive? Well, I mean, you're you're alive now. You might not remember your birth, but then, okay, I assume that you like me, and you assume you're mortal, and one day we're going to die. You, you know, you might be wake up every morning and think this is the last day of my life, and you'll be wrong, and but one day you will be right. And so then in that question, how would you know you're dead? Well, you won't any more than you know when you've fallen asleep. Um... Right. Okay. So, so, now, so now imagine this. In some time between birth and death, you were reborn. You had a complete reset and were reborn. So how would it be like, now take the thing you're saying, it would be like you were asleep. So it was kind of like when you were born, this kind of emptiness, unless you're a bullshitter and you try and read, read your you know, past lives and channels, <laughs> and you, you're talking put shit. Put a story, yeah, yeah, put a story back into I'll your prove past. It. If anybody yeah, says yeah. they're channeling past lives or they remember past lives, or it's like, yeah. it's bullshit. I will prove it to you. If you, you come and I'll yeah. go through all the bullshit you're talking, and I'll basically, you might deny it, but everybody else who watches me will realize, okay, reincarnation is a load of old shit. And this person is. You, already, you already got, you already did that. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, yeah, but okay, but, but go with me. Go with me on this one. Go, so let, me, let me run on this one. So, okay, so then, yeah. So then imagine this. Then, like, in some way before you were born, there's this blackness, there's this emptiness. It's kind of like seeing, you know, what are you seeing behind your head? You can't see anything there. It's, just, it's not like black, it's just not there. And that's kind of like your birth, right? So now imagine you asleep. And somewhere in your sleep, you kind of imagined, you know, if you've ever done lucid dreaming and you think, you know, you're vaguely aware that you're dreaming and you think, you know, yeah. I know I'm asleep. You drift in and out and the dream goes on. It's like that movie Inception and you have these layers and you go in and out, but you get to some layer where you we kind of realize, you know, I'm, I'm probably you know. dreaming this and you kind of drift in along. Now imagine somebody. <clears throat> Inside the dream, you're thinking, maybe I should wake up. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm almost waking up. Is this a dream or not? And you're going through thoughts like that. Now, imagine in that, in that, you dreamt that somebody came to you, right? Imagine he has like a long white beard and stuff, and you start discussing it with him. And you say like, you know, who are you? And the guy says, I'm the guy that's going to wake you up from this dream. You know, Gandalf and, you know, the... Harry Potter scene, which we just posted on XR Med. So you're in the kind of matrix, and there's Gandalf, and he says, uh, "Is it? But but who are you? You you know?" And you just say, uh, "The guy with the white beard says, I'm a creation of your own mind." He says, "You're dreaming, and you want to wake up. You created me. You manifested me to wake you up." And then you say, "Well, how do I know that's true? How do I, how do I know?" That, you know, when I'm awake, you say that, then maybe I wake up, you know, are you gone or what? How will I know I'm woken up? And the guy says like this, wax you on the head. And suddenly you go, Poof! and you wake up and you're in bed and you go, yeah. fuck. Where's the guy with the white beard? Yeah. And stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, but you would have no doubt when once you woke up. That you were having a dream, you would remember it, and you would remember this is a discontinuity in your awake. So it's exactly like that now. So, so ask yourself this: You know you exist, right? And here's Lord Hugh, right? I don't exist, Gary. You manifested me out of the ether. I'm just an ele electronic. I'm digital. I'm virtual reality. I'm just a digital graphic. I don't exist. You exist, Gary, not me. You manifested me to wake you up. Now, wake up.
Sorry, I can't say anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. Then you're dead. Yeah. Okay. Whoever speaks at that moment is dead. Okay, so you spoke, you died. In that moment, you died. So let me explain to you why if you were awake, you wouldn't need to speak at that point. So th there's this, uh, the Buddha. Somebody I also, oh, the uh, I can't remember the exact, <laughs> the exact story, but there was also the same, the same thing. I can't remember the names and the, the details, but it went something like this, so I'll paraphrase. But somebody asked the Buddha exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, what is enlightenment and how do I know I'm enlightened? And the, I can't quite remember what the Buddha said, but it was, he started to explain in, in, in enlightenment, or maybe he didn't even start. But at some, at some point, um, he just took a flower. There was a, there was yeah, a, it's ma Mahakasyapa, just the flower. Right, that, that so, the, so he, he took yeah. the flower and he just twirled it. Just in That's what he just twirled that, that flower in his face. And, and of all his disciples, there's only one, I can't remember his name, uh, and he smiled. He was the only yeah. guy that got it. Yeah. And then yeah. I think the Buddha handed over his reign yeah. to that guy. But yeah. he, he, you see, the Buddha yeah. knew straight away that that, that that guy didn't need to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, when you spoke then, what yeah. what made you speak and why? You see, it's, it's kind of like oh. Wittgenstein, right? You, you, you mentioned something about Wittgenstein. So, Man, so Wittgenstein. you should have felt my, my insides. My whole, <laughs> did, like, af after about, I'm, like... I'm telling you, you're not enlightened yet. Yeah. Oh, shit, I shouldn't say that. that I, I can't condemn you to, to unenlightenment. No, I'm not, I'm not. But, but, but yeah, here, let me tell you right. about Wittgenstein. The, the, um... So Wittgenstein, he got here. If I had thought Wittgenstein is such an interesting character because I can't, I can't tell you if Wittgenstein was enlightened or not. He appears enlightened, uh, and then every now and again <laughs> I go, but mm, somehow no, I don't know. No. He's, he's so interesting yeah, yeah. because he's kind of like a breach yeah. birth. You know, enlightenment is like a new birth, and it's kind of so. Wittgenstein wrote the Tractatus, and it, he ends it. He, he doesn't, uh, it's kind of like you would do. The spiritual thing is right at the end. You, you read the whole thing. But, I've but read he's it. Doing, and, he's doing spiritual stuff all the way through. He's doing yes, as a all the way through. Yeah. He's doing a coin. Yes. He's trying to look in logic and see the sound of one hand happening. Well, logic, I'll tell you, yeah. from Girdle and Turing and stuff, logic doesn't work. It doesn't compute. Rationality is not what you think it is. It's either inconsistent or incomplete. Is the very opposite of what rational people want it to be. Wow. So, so he goes yeah, through logic. Exactly no, no, no. Like I, I know what you're saying. It's all right. No, other people I, don't. You, other people don't. Let me finish. All right. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So he goes okay. through. He goes through the tractatus and with logic. He's yeah. doing on paper. Yeah. He's working his fucking brain out of his head. In the yeah. end, he basically comes to the conclusion and says, you know. That which cannot be said, you know, whereof we cannot speak, therefore, thereof, we must be silent. And at that so, moment, right. you assume, well, now he's reached Zen. He's enlightened. But No, he? he didn't, though. He, he had only arrived at the door. He took a sharp but, turn exactly. and left. Because why? Because he fucking wrote it down. You know that he hasn't. You see, basically, he's still fucking talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, you see, it's the same reason yeah. why you can say to anybody. I just said on 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 Reddit that to to, to somebody, maybe you. I, I said uh, um, the the thing about a tongue lying, right? So so if if anybody says you know like oh I'm going to be reincarnated, or I wasn't reincarnated, you can just dismiss them as a liar. Why? Because it's their tongue talking. The so tongue, then basically yeah, you say, yeah. you know, your tongue was born and it's going to die. Ask your fucking mom and ask your fucking priest or doctor. That's the trajectory of your tongue. 
your tongue is has its existence and for sure it's not going to be reincarnated if you're jewish or something and you think you're going to be reincarnated in the same body do some fucking physics you're yeah. bullshitting yourself yeah. so yeah. basically your tongue is as sure as fucking physics gonna die so when your tongue says i'm not gonna die you say like well it's lying so in essence kind of that's what what wittgenstein is saying i'm not gonna die at the end of it but he's saying well it's a lie because you said that with your right hand and a pen you said it in other words with your tongue and that's a lie so then think of it so then wittgenstein says okay right i'll correct that so then basically you have to say something like well my tongue is going to speak the truth now so it's not going to say i'm going to live on but it's going to say he or it or the thing that's observing <laughs> This tongue is going to live on and shall return one day. <laughs> and you're saying, well, yeah, but that's also going to mislead people terribly because then they think you're Jesus or something and they think, oh, Jesus will return. You see, imagine Jesus is saying, I will come again. I will return. And you say, well, it's not your tongue. The tongue's talking. So it's like it's the body talking. And he says, I will come again. So straight out, that's a lie. I'm not expecting to see Jesus' body fucking in a terrible state. And I think the fuckers ate it. And I'll go into that in the videos. But whatever happened, I, I'm, I don't think you're going to see Jesus uh, get his cock out in a bar anytime soon. His body's done. It's kind of decrepit. So, so he's definitely not coming back in the body. The body that was talking is a liar. So then if Jesus comes back, what bit of him comes back? You say, well, is how do you say how would that Jesus body tell the truth? Say, yeah. well, what I mean is my consciousness is coming back. And you say, well, yeah, but everybody's got a fucking conscious, you know, it's like fucking dogs got a conscious, some some form of consciousness. So it's like so as long as there's consciousness, you're coming back. Hooray. Mm -hmm. Whoever's talking, sorry, here, can I, can I, so you can, can I say, I, oh, right, you're not, you're going to die. Don't, don't lie. And you say, well, consciousness will always be around. You say, mm, maybe, maybe not. It looks like we're all going extinct. If we're the last uh, consciousness in the universe, it's good. Goodbye for keep, dude. So, so yeah, I think, I hope that gives you some insight. <laughs> sorry if I gave No, no, I, I actually, to, to be honest, I'm not, not, uh, sorry, I don't mean to be rude. I actually wasn't interested in that thing, that, that reincarnation thing, particularly or other people might be. Um, it's the same as God. If somebody's talking about God, just, just say I'm a militant yeah, yeah. do not insult hang me on, with hang on. Can... imaginary friend in the sky. You can be as insulting as you want because they're lying. If they, the fact they put a label on God means that they're not talking about God. You say, well, you can't, by definition, you can't talk about God. Otherwise, you're lying. And Can that's where all the something? prohibitions, that's why the Monty Python thing comes in. So, oh, mentions yeah. Jehovah will be stoned. <laughs> and then it's like, <laughs> it's like, well, how do you say you're not allowed to word, mention that word? Which word? Jehovah. Oh, fuck, he's stoned. <laughs> so you can't talk yeah, about here. God. Right. So then what do you uh, say? Well, you shut the fuck up, look at the sunset, and if the friend next to you knows that, knows that you are God and he is God, and you're looking at God, what the fuck is there more to say? There's only stuff to say while well, a guy talks. And if anybody, everybody would just shut the fuck up with that. But then you get... Yeah, you that's know, what I don't... Oh, 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 man, I'm going to stop for a minute. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I've got to insist. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to fucking talk. stop you. <laughs> Hugh... Gary, Cortex wants to talk. I, no, it doesn't. I, want, I actually want to shut up. I want to just... just um, something's going on here. Um, <laughs> Do, do you mind? I, I, might, I might just just uh, um, I might just I might have to leave the meeting here. Um, it's got nothing to do with you, nothing at all. Wait, be careful. Remember, does it does it a number eight? All right. Remember, does, what does you it do, what, number eight? Very well. I don't know what it is, Hugh. What is it? 
go have a look at it, but make sure you obey Desiderata and obey. No, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. I, I mean, I mean, you, you, you've, you've exploded me. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, I, don't, I can't describe this. I'm sorry. I, I can't. I can't. I can't tell it to you at the moment. I don't know what to say. Why don't you, Gary? Um, because we all we all feeling. I mean, we all feel enormous, intense uh, things during these meetings. We all think of oh, our fuck much, and we all. So why all don't right, you? Tell all right. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. You, you sat there. You, you fucking did it. You, you, you sat there and and you said, "Wake up." And um. I don't know what happened. Um, but I, uh, can I, I, I'd like to interject you, real quick. You said oh, I, fucking, yeah. I didn't say a fucking word, you. Like my insides were, they're still exploding. My heart's pounding as though I've just run a fucking marathon. Um, something got, something happened. That's all I can say. What else am I going to fucking say? But you're carrying on, and I'm like, fuck, Jesus. I, I don't think... At this at the moment, I don't give a fuck about reincarnation. I'm sorry. Um, I don't think you should be giving you that um, release. You should be releasing yourself. I mean... No, no, because I, he's I, just I, sitting I, I, there uh, talking. You, you just a minute ago, Michael, when he's just now, just now, I was as blissed out as anything that just happened. I, uh, I, don't, yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I don't need it. I mean... I, I, but, okay. Yeah, Hugh knows about that. We've discussed that anyway. Yeah. He, he knows what what goes on. Sorry, I, I'm sorry, Michael. I didn't. I don't mean to, to dismiss you at all. Please oh, no, don't just, be offended. I'm just trying yeah. to read the this situation. Is sure. This, this, this is, is intense. Very yeah. intense. Um, let, let's not. This this is important. Um, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's important. So yeah, the the uh, the wind is blowing now, and there's a big storm. Oh, that's, and there's, uh, light, there's lightning behind your head. Lightning <laughs> behind my head. Yeah, it's it's. I get a bit gaslit because if you do what I just did, you will see that stuff like that. I'm very pleased that the. Uh, the internet connection is not getting touchy. That's the other thing. If you if you take this stuff too far, you will. I must. I must warn people of that. You must. You you will see some very strange things, right? And you, you will get gaslit. So, again, one of the things that makes that stops people getting somewhere is this kind of uh, policeman that steps steps in the room, right? Um, I can't mention it. Fuck! How do I say this? Because because we had a private conversation, Gary. That that just as you, people are getting to a point of true love, um, you can expect a policeman to step in. So just just like the guru can step in and awaken you. There's a policeman that will come, step in and stop you. And I mean, uh, how do you interpret? How do you interpret that? It's basically you have to practice until you can stop that policeman coming in the room. See, they 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 used to say in the '60s, you have to get the cop inside us out. It's not enough to to get the cop off the street. What I'm trying to say is that if there are cops on the street in front of you and you're trying to be a flower child, is is you manifesting those cops? Those cops are really in your head and you have to get them out of your head. But I don't want to be too mystic and woo-woo, but you, you can get gaslit because quite literally a cop can step in the room. Um, and... You know, say so like I just told you. Well, you're manifesting that cop. Cops don't exist. <laughs> oh shit! No, 
to see the lightning and stuff behind me. <laughs> it's, it's getting really gothic. Yeah. It, it, so what I'm trying to say is it, it, it'll get gothic. Now, yeah. the only thing I can tell you is I, I eventually got a taste for the gothic and I got, I got a taste for the surreal. Um, so I would go to places and I've seen such incredible things. That I won't begin to tell you because, you know, uh, yeah, people, people don't need to know that stuff, but, but yeah, I would seek it out. I mean, if, if I, I go to foreign places, like, um, I remember, okay, I'll tell you one just because now I'm, I'm, I've kind of said too much. Okay, so I'll give you an example. I went to a friend's wedding in Venice, and we all, you know, drank in like Harry's bar and a famous bar. I think was like Ernest Hemingway, I think. <laughs> and it's very, one of my favorite places in the world. And it, everybody, you know, everybody drank themselves. Very old friends, right? It was a big moment, very dramatic time, a wedding. It's a perfect time for this stuff and a place like Venice and everybody went to sleep. And I thought, uh, every, you know, kind of broke up at like four in the morning and went to sleep. And I thought they can't go to sleep. It's like, you know, the, the psychic material at this moment is just too huge. But I, what I did, what I always do in that's basically, I just go ahead on my own. So I went out on the streets of Venice at night. It was moonlit and yeah, I, uh, I just went exploring just, just at random getting lost and there was no one, there was absolutely no one on the streets. It yeah. was just, yeah. it was, uh, and now I know that not a lot of people would, would be able to do it. It's just too damn Gothic and it's just too, too damn fucking scary, but you get to a certain point where you just like it. You know, it's, it's kind of Salvador Dali and it's Gothic and you say, I, I like it. You don't feel safe, but I, I mean, I know that there are a lot of people out there that are looking, going on. There's a thing, there's a whole cult, subculture of people that go into haunted houses and ruin my, my nephew did it and they would go and record more lightning. They'd go and re record all yeah. these weird things in these things and then put, you know, there's, there's the subcult of people putting them up on the internet and going and spooking themselves, going to haunted places and stuff. And and so I would I would do that. I was surprised that the kids are doing that because I <laughs> I did that on my own for my whole life. But anyway, I'll, I'll round off the story in in just to give you a feel. And I'm only telling you this to give you a feel of what what could happen and what it's like. But I got to this one uh, kind of you know it was almost like a Hollywood scene in a way. Disney couldn't have done a better job in terms of lighting and stuff. And so I'm going around deadly silent, all these narrow medieval houses as medieval setting. And out of the side, I couldn't believe it, but there was this dog that was the size of a fucking horse came out. And it was, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, not a rock filer, a, a great Dane. Yeah. Great Dane. Um, and pitch black. And it came out and looked at me and I thought, Oh, this is interesting. <laughs> There's nowhere to run to. And then another one came out next to it. Right. And both of them came out, stood in my path in this moonlight thing, just standing dead there. Both of them looking at me in a kind of a standoff. And I thought, well, I'm in fucking trouble now because if I turn and run, they're going to take me down. And I just got to stand my ground and see where this goes. But I was like thinking, this is territory I didn't expect. So I just stood my ground and I didn't dare breathe. And then the weirdest thing happened is somebody said in an English voice, they said basically from around the corner where they came out of, presumably the owner, said, um, said, Damocles, Mephistopheles, heal. And both of the dogs turned around and went back around the corner. So basically you can take that. Well, how are you going to take that? Well, you could take it. Well, I hallucinated it. 
I can't deny. It, I, uh, it could be that it's just some English guy who lives in Venice and he's out for a moonlight walk with his dogs and it would that would also absolutely fit. In fact, that's my preferred explanation. Or you could just go gothic and say like I, I had an encounter with the devil. But you see what I mean is you will never get to certainty with those kind of things. You can spend hours analyzing what will happen. And I would never share this with, with you in general, but the reason I'm sharing it with you is if, if these kind of things happen to you, then, you know, I don't think it's anything to be alarmed with. Stand your ground. And um, I don't know anybody that really was ripped apart in one of these <laughs> encounters. So... You know, I mean, uh, there might be survivor bias. I, I <laughs> maybe all the guys that uh, did come off on the the wrong end of these kind of encounters are not here to tell about it. But if you, yeah, I mean, all the guys who tell about it are they survivors, so they they, you know, obviously biased towards the saying that well, you won't come to any harm. <laughs> So if you um, know Wilson, uh, Wilson and, and guys like that, yeah. Uh, sorry, Alistair who? Crowley. Who was it? Alistair Crowley. Yeah, Robert Robert Anton Wilson and Alistair Crowley. Oh, yeah. So they they yeah. like old hands of this ter territory, um, yeah. and so, uh, yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, yeah, but I know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you for a fact that you you'll never ca come to understand you know what it is you're actually experiencing you can't tell if you you know hallucinating it you can't tell if it's real uh, but you know suffice to say that all these things exist any any priest or something will tell you that it, these things are actually for real but yeah, yeah it's, isn't this warning. also a, I, I no no I don't have a problem with that in fact um uh yeah what you're saying is just just um uh how can i put it you, you you're not really saying anything terribly different from what i've experienced um uh it, it's also a way a, a bit of a parallel to uh uh this disciple i was talking about earlier who might have woken up that uh, that might be one explanation for what's happened to him, but there could be others. Um, th th he's trying to yeah, think it, know, and you probably you just what, 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 what has, has. Do you think he might be enlightened? Who's this? Who? Uh, I, mean, I, I know his name, but you, do you want me to say his name? N no, uh, uh, give me a, a clue. I'm sorry, because you broke up. I couldn't quite hear you properly. You oh, oh, oh. Say what you just said. Uh, do, do you think he's enlightened, your friend? Who's this? My friend? Yeah. He's, it's, uh, look, Hugh, I can't pick a hole in him, and I've tried. But at other times, he behaves like a very fallible human being. And it was one of the things I wanted to bring up with you, if I can, just for a moment, seeing we've got that close to it, is, for instance, if we go back to the video on the uh, regarding the 6th of January in uh, in um, the United States, where that you remember the video you made where you were you were very emotionally, um, you know, you were visibly upset, and uh, yeah, I thought we were for it actually, yeah. I I well, I, I thought afterwards. Um, that a few things that an enlightened person is not a robot, they're still a human being. Um, but I was kind of wondering, like, when you were in that state, were you, were you, did the state have you or did you have the state, basically, I guess? I, I the rain is coming down hard and I've got it on full volume, so <laughs> yeah, just yeah. keep talk loud, right. I, I, I'm saying in that in that in where how you were in that video for, for the for the capital riot where you were emotionally overwrought, were you having that state or was the state having you? I mean, were you no, still? No, I, I, 
was, um, I was having that state. So the aim is not yeah. to become human, inhuman. The aim is to be No, no, human. that's what I mean. <laughs> yes, yes. Look, I'm a chimp. This is a thing. Like, like you, we're primates. It's like it, you don't want yeah. – you, you see, a, a lot of people – this is the essence of transhumanism is people want to become an inhuman. It's the opposite. Yeah. You want to yeah. be able to feel and stuff. I, I, I was generally fucked up by that, the, the, the capital rights, because I, yes. see, a lot of things have been converging and I, I still don't understand what happened there because it, I mean, what I saw, which everybody else didn't see at the time, was that it was a fucking inside job. So I could see how well it yeah. was orchestrated. I've been following... No, no, just, 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 yeah. and, uh, but, but no, let me... Let no, me I just so want to stay with you. I was yeah. going to stay with you and your experience. Don't get off the track. Um, yeah. um, oh, no, no, I was describing but, yeah. why, what I was feeling. What I was feeling, you know. Oh, no, I think we oh. understood that. We understood that you that you, oh, okay. you, you, you realised the implications. I think all of us understood that. Yeah, that you, I, that you I was, had I was seen it for everybody and and my yeah, family in, yeah. in the states yeah yeah there, there, there's this yeah. thing where people think i mean uh, again you you get people mimicking the buddha state and and you have yes that's people, right yeah i mean all the buddhists i know have a fucking buddhist yeah. ego i mean somebody sent me a no. link to one the, the other day he said oh i know what you're talking about it's this stupid Indian cunt who's go is basically talking about ego and dropping the ego on in it. He's got fucking three stripes of Vishnu, a fucking Bindu in his thing, and he's talking about Hindu and saying about the Bhagavad Gita. And I'll tell you, if, if you're the cunt who sent that, that, it's like, go and go and get hold of that idiot in India and tell him to shut the fuck up because he's got a fucking Hindu ego. He should not be teaching anybody. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. He's mouthing off from the Gita second hand. He's got okay, a fucking Okay, can, can I interrupt you? All yeah. right, now don't get carried away. Settle down. Just just settle down. It's not good for your blood pressure. I'll, I'll well, just... Um, it's, it's carried away is because of the, these people have an idea that you become this holy saint and... No, no. I mean, I get it. I get it. Yeah. I just want to, uh, can I just say something to Sophie for a minute, that, that when we were talking, I was, Sophie and I were having a conversation about partially, it was about you, um, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention was um, that, that um, we were just talking about how you come across and that kind of thing, and um, one thing I've become aware of is that people do tend to think that these these rarefied, enlightened people do become, as you said, something transhuman, perhaps. And you know, in my experience, you, you, if, well, you know, you maintain your personality. Your, if you, if you were an objectionable shithead and a rather unperson to be around, and that was your personality before, you'd probably still be like that after you've woken up. You, you don't lose your, 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 you know, um, and. Uh, you know, I was also taking that into account when I was thinking about you and that and that video for the Capitol rights and that too. I thought, well, not only is he still remaining, a, does he still remain a human being, but he still remains with all his characteristic responses. Um, that's that doesn't you, you don't you don't become this this rarefied thing that doesn't exhibit human feeling. What I'd like to just say to you, if I if I can, is uh, that um, that it's very much like uh, the experience I've been having for about the past week or so, a, a very significant emotional distress. And uh, there, there seemed to be, I, I think I rang you up. I, I don't know what I did. I can't even remember that. Was it. Um, and uh, I was aware that the only thing I could do was just to uh, just to, to to know that it was there to not to just be with it um, and it went away and then it would come back and it went away and it would, and I thought I'm getting nowhere but after a very long time it it did just go um, you and dissociated, I dissociated right you 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 did the dissociation I was trying to get you to by putting pressure on you. 
Yeah, but I suppose I don't know. I, I'm just telling you what I was doing. I'm not, I don't know, I don't quite know whether dis- I'm not sure that I quite understand dissociation. Well, what it, it's mean? kind of like an out of body um, experience. I don't, you know, what you put under the umbrella of dissociation um, is is dissociation is one of the responses of, by what I understand, what I gather. There's other ones which well, dissociation is part of the flight response. Um, Okay, but there's the fight and there's the freeze and no, the no, no. I was going the other way. I was, I was going the other way. That this is like, yeah. what you're talking about. What? Well, can you clarify that? Yeah. No, I don't think it was dissociation. Sorry, you, you well, talk. Who, who are you asking to clarify that, me or Gary? Whoever wants to answer that from their perspective, you know, because um, it, it's interesting because you you brought up the word dissociation when you when you mentioned the word um, when you talked about awakening and and yeah, and, earlier, people, yeah. and I I was kind of trying to, the cha- to understand what the, world, yeah. what the word dissociation meant oh, really okay. in yeah. this context. So, so, so you, you know? remember Adam Curtis. Um, the, the best way to think about it is if you're in a traumatic situation like a car crash or something like that, if you ask people to describe what happened in the car crash, they will always, if it was bad enough, or kind of near-death experience, they will always get to a point, uh, aircraft crash, something like that. They will tell you that it, it was like a dream or I was looking down at myself from above. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you people say, I woke up, on the operating table and you know i had this out of body experience well what's happening is it's fucking traumatic to be on an operating table and see you know no one wants to see their insides opened up and so so you know the way uh our the way we cope with it is we kind of dissociate so that basically we we don't take the trauma personally it's it's nature's way of making sure that we're not permanently psycholog- psychologically damaged. So it's, it's it kind of saying, this is not happening to me, it's happening to somebody else. And so that's the organism's way of preserving itself uh, with that dissociation. It, uh, it's no, Adam that's not what I was said, doing, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, no, wait a second. But Adam, so, so Adam Curtis yeah. said mentioned about um, Richard Nixon. So Richard... You could tell Adam Curtis didn't know what the fuck was going on with with Richard Nixon because he said yeah. Richard Nixon looked in the mirror and told us he told his psychologist that when I look in the mirror, there's nobody there. Now you could tell that mm. Adam Curtis was confused by that and he didn't really understand. But but let me let me try and explain that to you. If you get like somebody like Richard Nixon, if you're president and the it's so overwhelming for a human being to be like the, the U.S. president. Uh, it's it's just so much stimulus, so much important stuff. Um, you you can see them age. It's it's really like being on LSD for for your whole entire presidential term. You you know when they come out of it, they're psychologically a hundred years older, and the reason is they've taken on a lot of psychological barrage and stuff, and they they really under PTSD. A U.S. president is going to come out even before they go in, they've got PTSD. That's why we shouldn't be making these presidents. Because, So the only way they can be a president, the only way Richard Nixon can be a president and survive without going nuts is being, um, you know, psychopathic and being semi-dissociated. So that can go on so long that when Richard Nixon wakes up in the morning, he looks in the mirror and there's no one there. You've got to think, why? It's because he's having that traumatic out-of-body experience. He's so he's responding so much, being someone else in front of the cameras, you know, thinking what this means in terms of how it moves markets. Every you know, like Biden, he just fell on the aircraft stairs, you know, and then that like moves markets. So basically, people are selling all their gold store thinking, or you know, changing their political alliances, thinking now we're going to have like President Kamala Harris, because you can see that, you know, Biden tripping on the stair, you think, oh, this guy hasn't got much longer. So he can't even, as a president, he can't even trip. So he's watching himself, self-observation so much, every single movement, every single month. You see, what you, most average liberal dickhead doesn't, looks at these guys on the podium and they think they're looking at themselves. They haven't got a clue how polished they are, so that how glib they are, and how there's no emotion. 
Yeah, I guarantee if you've got somebody like Obama or, or uh, Biden now, you know, you look at him and you think, well, the guy's feeling this and he's expressing this. And I said, put a gal galvanometer in his palm and do a, gal a galvanic skin response. Put him on a lie detector while he's doing that. And there's fuck all going on. Essentially, he's, he's you know, basically he's got no insulin. He's got no adrenaline. Is is uh, is a dream, basically a is a what's the thing that makes adre adrenaline again? Uh, the the, the adrenal, the adrenal gland. Oh, yeah, there's a, his ad adrenal gland is essentially yeah. kaput, uh, and, and so he's faking. He's he's like a marionette, and he's not really there. Even while he's saying, "Oh, I'm responding to the interviewer," and he's he's doing a human. But he's completely not there. That's that's why David Icke and that say that these guys are, you know, alien and reptiloid and stuff, because David yeah. Icke is shrewd enough to see that they're not really there. That's why I call it the alien cortex too. It's basically they are living alienated. You have to in those things. If so, now a few years back, the the transcendentalists and Maharishi and stuff when they came in in the 60s they told all these kids in the 60s about transcendental meditation and and what they said was a lot of you know they talked a lot about enlightenment and what the Maharishi said blew their mind he said you know a lot of guys in the corporate field and CEOs they're already in Saturi 64 Saturi 64 was their word for enlightenment and all these you know hippies went like what these are fucking suits. They like they they the enemy, the antichrist. These guys are never gonna smoke weed and you know have daisies and poppies and do stuff in an atom. How, they can't be enlightened. They they the opposite of enlightened. So they were shocked to hear the Maharishi say that no, a lot of these guys are in Saturi 64. And what, what he's saying is they're already living outside the body, just looking down on them as if they are completely dissociated from it. That's exactly the same state as you'll get into, say, if you get raped or beaten or tortured or something like that. If they waterboard you, uh, at some stage it becomes intolerable and you, you will, you know, eventually have an out-of-body experience. You'll, you will dissociate from the physical body and then just to preserve your psyche. And that, that's done in the spirit tradi traditional for good effect. It, it, you see... The, you see, without the knowledge, you can put somebody in that state, but leave them in a terrible state because they've got no context to interpret it. But I'll tell you, they've waterboarded people. A lot of the guys that they've tortured in the jihad and that, they've made them enlightened. But look at the context. It was done in the context of the U.S. military in the state waterboarding somebody, giving this experience. So they become enlightened and they, they're broken after that. They're not born. They kind of aborted so they put them through the birthing experience without saying this is a birthing experience and it's you know we're waterboarding you for your spiritual growth and at the end of this you're going to be christ just fucking waterboard them and then leave them in an orange suit in guantanamo bay and he's like whoa dudes that's the right idea but that brings us back to, in a funny loop back to what gary was saying earlier about yeah that's what i was just going to say yeah. people who are awoke, awakened it's a certain yeah awakened and who don't know it. they wake up into a they, they wake up into you know a I mean? context and then situation. they're back into this they don't they have been led yeah. by whatever event dissociative or what uh near death yeah. whatever and they don't know but but you see like Dos yeah. Dostoevsky, right so then the, afterwards yeah. I, I don't think yeah. Dostoevsky yeah. knew what had gone he had gone through so so then all they do is they start babbling and they write books and then people like Jordan Peterson get them and go, ah, I found gold and stuff and goes, goes through all these books, but it's not gold. It's trash. It's basically the guy can't tell you what, what happened. Right? So he, he, he's a very bad interpreter of that experience. And what he's going to do is fuck somebody like Jordan Peterson up. And the, the reason why is he, he basically gives a splat of information that will take Jordan Peterson his entire life to sort through if he goes into deeply into Dostoevsky and so you see he's wasting his time you've only got a lifetime a window of time to basically get enlightened <clears throat> and essentially what Dostoevsky's book has done is it's Machio and if somebody like Jordan Peterson goes into that 
he will basically get lost in that. It's like the Bible. The Bible is a fucking tar trap. What it's designed to do is waste time. So you get sucked in to, to the Bible, and it's just a briar patch. You can you can spend the rest of your life going through the Bible and stuff and just getting caught deeper and deeper caught in those twisted logic and contradiction and stuff. And that's all it's there for. It's the alien cortex's way of just basically throwing sand in your eyes. So you don't get to you be destroying the alien cortex. And that, that's what most of these things are like. Just one more thing. If you ever saw the movie Contact, I will contact, I think it was, yeah. a recent movie where they have these kind of squid-like things that come down in the UFO. And then the the uh, the state tries to blow them up. Yes. And then they get the, the, up, they the, the yeah. last yeah. said poof, like that. Right? Yeah. So when you're reading Dostoevsky or the Bible or some shit like that, you're reading that splat of all this, you know, all these fucking things. Now, now that's a tar trap, because if you go and look at all of those things, you they fractal. You'll just disappear. Now, not just you will disappear, but not in a good way. You won't disappear by being awake. You'll disappear by being asleep, and forever you'll be running after, like Frankenstein running after their monster. And that's in essence what they what they do. That's why our alien cortex created the Bible is to waylay us on the path to enlightenment. And what's that enlightenment? The alien cortex doesn't want you, and by that I mean yourself, to sit on the throne of God. The, the Bible is there to distract you from the fact that you are God. So it's basically it's it, it's you are like the the imposter prince and the bible there is 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 kind of or the alien cortex its representative is is kind of like an imposter kind of a say the the um, the butler who's taken over the household and the butler keeps on presenting himself as the king and what he's trying to do is not let it's the same thing as ratatouille it's the same plot as ratatouille it's the the, the chef that takes over the business and tries to stop the rightful king knowing that he's actually the inheritor of the entire kingdom. It's one of Milaponti's stock stories, you know, that the 24 plots, and some people say 12, and some people say only one. But anyway, one of them is the prince that doesn't know he's a prince that has been usurped in his kingdom, it's Hamlet. And then basically he discovers himself and takes over the kingdom again it's all a metaphor for you doing in yourself your alien cortex is the usurper and then it will argue as i'm the king i'm the thing and it starts labeling and starts labeling you and itself it's trying to preserve itself and what it doesn't want you to do is to basically say you're the butler i was always the king and the king we're talking about is yahweh it's the god the father it's basically the the God that everybody's in church praying to. It's like, don't go to church and pray to a fucking altar. You're God. They're trying to distract you. The priest is trying to distract you. He's trying to say, God's in heaven. Jesus is up here. Say, I'm Jesus. I'm God is what, what the what the priest is, is trying to prevent you thinking. It's Gnosticism, right? It's Gnosticism. The Gnostics were heretics because they saw through it and they said, they said fuck the church. We're God. They say, like, no, that'll ruin it for the slaves. It's basically it's a con game. Yeah. Um, can I, um, I? I don't know how appropriate this is. Uh, oh, Shit, we're what? almost at two. What hours. doesn't go on this show? <laughs> um, Way back earlier, when you were talking about somebody holding a gun to your head, and that you had a precognition of your your that you still had a life on the other side of that, and this kind of thing, and it also relates to dissociation, um, uh, because uh, one thing that I was thinking uh, over the last few days was. Um, when my friend said to me, stop wasting your time, you're trying to do something you've already done. And I thought, well, okay, supposing this, supposing I have done it, when might it have happened? Because I'm, I wasn't aware that it happened. And I started sifting back through my life, trying to find a point where I thought this might have happened. Um, I was involved in a very 
sort of major traffic accident when I was uh, in my mid twenties. Um, it was absolutely known about before I had it. I dreamed it for years, night after night. I would dream this accident. the 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 only difference in the dream from the reality was that in the dream I was riding a motorcycle. But in the reality, I was riding a bicycle, and the only other difference was that it was on the opposite side of the road, but it was exactly the same part of the stretch of road. The, when the accident happened, um, I one thing now that I look back on it, which was very interesting, um, I was suffocating. I probably had about a minute to go. There were people standing around the car who didn't want to move me because they thought it would cause more damage. I couldn't get enough breath to say to them, you must move me because I can't breathe, I'm going to suffocate. I couldn't talk to them to tell them what to do. But they must have got me out of the car. I don't remember that little bit where they got me out of the car, but I remember being on the ground, the ambulance people coming and uh, and doing things like my my both my arms and my leg were, were smashed up completely mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were telling me to sort of they were obviously trying to stabilize the, the fractures you know they were telling me to try and move my arm which you know would only half of it would have moved. anyway and then there was the ambulance and I had to wait in the hospital for a very long time before any treatment came because it was a Sunday evening they couldn't get the surgeon to come and all this kind of thing um, and it went on and on one thing that was very interesting is that I was completely calm the whole time. In in the dream, I was terrified because I thought I'll never be able to bear the pain and the, the physical damage and the blood and the bones sticking out everywhere and all this kind of thing. But in the reality, it was I was at peace. Everybody else was very worked up, and I, I was, you know, now. So in my uh, um, little exploration where I was saying supposedly I had an awakening and, a, and, and and but I didn't know it. I thought, well, one of the one way that could happen is that if there's so much else was going on at the time, and so a massive change has occurred in your life at the time, you might not notice that there was a shift in a, in another way, um, because I was then in hospital for many months completely couldn't couldn't feed myself couldn't go go i needed people you can't go to the toilet you needed assistance for absolutely everything i couldn't do a thing for for for, for months um and um all that time i, I was it, perfectly i was just perfectly content to just lie there I, I i very rarely felt distressed or or um um I don't know. I mean, I had a nurse come in one day and comment on the fact that I wasn't freaking out as I was supposed to be. She, you know, um, it's, it was a rather peculiar experience. And I kind of wondered whether the, 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 the shock of that might have pushed me to, into a new place and I never realised that I had been pushed into a new place because it all got smothered under all the physical goings on at the time. Um, but you kind of spurred me back to it because where you, especially where you mentioned you had the precognition of, of, of I didn't have the precognition of what was going to come up, come later in my life, but I had the precognition of the fact that this would event would occur as though it was some, some absolutely like it was kind of your destiny that you were going to be alive later on. It was my destiny that that accident was going to happen for whatever reason. Um, uh, and there, but there wasn't when you were having the discussion a minute ago. There wasn't a dissociation. Um, and again, I wanted to go back just a minute ago. I'm terribly sorry if it sounds like I'm talking about myself so much. Um, uh, to Not to last know. week when I was uh, just, if I can just come forward in time to last week where I was in a substantial state of distress. There was family problems and practical problems going on that were pretty nasty here. Um, and again, when I was experiencing these very powerful emotions, which is one of the things that made me think of you on that January the 6th video, 
when I was experiencing them, I can't say I was dissociating. What I was attempting to do and what I was doing was go doing the reverse, going into them and doing that, that exercise that I mentioned last time. Go into the emotion and say, how big is it? What, is it is it blue? Is it in your middle? Is it expanding? What, what, tell me about this emotion. Is it is it rough or smooth or or what's it like? And after, if you go right into the thing rather than than go away from it, that was what seemed to produce a result. It seemed to to lose its power. It would come back repeatedly, repeatedly. I what, what really I felt I was doing was something like Buddha sitting under the tree where all the demons would roll up in front of the Buddha and try and freak him out, and he would just, you know, I'll just face them all down one at a time as they come. What astonished me was how long you have to do that for before before it had any effect. You, so literally that, days and days and days. That is the long night of the soul. So you, you can go through one night and it'll be a thousand years in Kairos time. Yes, yeah, yes, that's it, yeah. Yeah, so what, I, I just what, wanted to say that. I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't what, know how relevant that is. I just to say what, where were you spiritually when you had that accident? Um, I was. I didn't know anything about. Um, um, no, I had no knowledge of very much at all. I knew I had known for a very long time that I was looking for something. That 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 everything around me just couldn't be taken. There, there, there definitely things weren't right the way they were. The, 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 the world couldn't be taken the way other people took it. I wasn't going to swallow it. I knew that I knew I, I knew I knew I was on some kind of a, uh, a a path of inquiry, but I could not have put words to it or told you anything about it. Um, I had been through suicidal sort of, um, you know, feeling feeling like that for for. for you know, a little while, a couple of years before that. Um, uh, yeah, see, this is the thing. Spiritually, I don't know. Um, uh, I think <clears throat> you know, there's always. I've always had this feeling of since I was very young, of looking for something else that other people weren't even recognizing existed. It was inchoate is the word, I think. You know, you were doing it naively or not na not naively. No, I knew I was after something, but I couldn't have told you anything about it. Um, so, yeah, so, I don't know. Here's my prognosis. That what, what I interpret that is you have an innate propensity for it and you, for enlightenment. But you, you, I think what might have happened is uh, you went off co half cock without the knowledge, so, mm. so you you precipitated, but you almost you're in a very dangerous state because I think you almost precipitated it physically. So in other words, yeah. you manifested yeah. it as a car yeah. accident instead of actually. yes. So it's basically a sheer violation of desiderati, <laughs> desiderata eight, mm. but. Yeah, yeah, all the pattern and the instincts are there. Yeah. Um, it was, it was basically just not the right uh, knowledge. So it, it kind of interpreted as negative. Um, I kind of like what I'd say is kind of like a male psychotic awakening instead of a you psychotic. Awakening. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, is that what's going on now? That that occurred then, but the process now is working back to to to. Uh, Integrate it to to yeah. make it yeah you, just make to sure rescue it, it I guess just just make sure it's done right sorry now. just make sure it's done right now so well no. I think it would be because now I've got an understanding that I didn't have then whatever happens now I would imagine I would recognize it so the I would recommend that the uh, you try and expand your ego outwards. You you very capable. You see, you can go two ways. You can either get rid of the ego by collapsing it into an atom, so it's meaninglessly small, or you can expand it so big that it's meaninglessly big. Yeah. You seem to have a propensity to to go for the small, and and I, I wonder if that yeah. isn't a mistake. You should try and expand it 
to the pool, to expand your horizons so, so that you have such a big ego, it's a, a meaningless, meaninglessly grandiose. You see, the kind of thing is if you don't have enough narcissism. You want to be so narcissistic that uh, it basically nullifies the narcissism. So in other words, the problem with narcissism, it's just thinking too small. <laughs> it, 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 it and stuff like that. I don't think he realizes that. He's, he seems to, he's a, he's a very cool guy, but he, he doesn't seem to have the knowledge of, of this part of narcissism. Is that he, he, uh, he doesn't, he still thinks of it as pejorative. He still thinks of narcissism as something bad. I think Vaknin's breakthrough is to, is to say like, you know, Vaknin, the problem with narcissism is it's just thinking too small. It's on the right track, it, but it's just thinking too small. He still thinks it's on the wrong track and it's something to be cured and something good because he's not enlightened. His alien cortex is saying, Vaknin, don't go down this route. I can't go down this route with you. It's like, Vaknin, there's the path to, to paradise and Eden down that route of complete narcissism that that his alien cortex won't let him fulfill you you, you so, mean and you mean and you, but you mean this in the sense of i you mean it in the sense of i am god narcissism is this what so, you mean by yeah, the, the large mass too small god's a three-letter word it's just too fucking small that, that's why i say is it's not god because if you're talking about god that's a fucking abomination. no no i know yeah, we, we, we've got to talk we've got we're stuffed we've got to use god. What Yahweh? You is that basically? If you want to be Jesus, fine, be Jesus. No. But they go in a straight jacket, and you fucking deserve it because you put yourself in a straight jacket. You said, "I'm Jesus." You stuck a label. That's what all these fucking use mild psychotics do. No, no, no. no. Look, Jesus, and you all right. off that fucker in a straight yeah. jacket. Why? Because he's labeled himself J E S U S. It's like yeah. great. He's a fucking moron. Put him but in I, I, I think that that kid, that Vaknin, as a psychologist, is most more interested in the the psychop the psychopathy aspect of the of narcissists because he doesn't dwell too deep into. I think he's he's you know that's what he that's what he's at. He talks about he describes really serious psychopathic behaviors from people in the very very high uh, spectrum of narcissism. So he is. Um, I, I, will, I like to listen to him because he's very clever and it's kind of, you know, it's a bit like psychological porn nearly. I know he's just trying. It's he's, he's, playing, he's playing with the audience. Yeah. And yeah, he is. He is. And all, absolutely. But I don't. It. Where, where, where he gets his kicks? Is that he knows what he's doing with the audience and the audience doesn't know yeah. what he's doing with yeah. it. So, so it's kind of like audience molestation. Yeah. It's not wholesome what he's no, doing. I know. I know. He, he's, he's getting into He's getting a power trip out of it because because he's 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 so clued in to what he's doing and yeah, he gets a kick out of the yeah. fact that other people becomes, don't know that he's, he's feeling he's a self-confessed extremely high-ranking narcissist on with with all the buttons like all the things and i think he's yeah he you know he knows it so but it's it's a bizarre it's a bizarre thing i i, I but to come back to what you were saying about uh, you, you were, you were, you were. What, what, what? I even, I even hesitate to use the word narcissism when you, when you want to describe how, um, how we should be towards ourselves. I, I, I think it's much more than that. Uh, it's, it's not narcissism is a, is a mirror thing. It's a, it's a reflection. It's not a real person that you're looking at. And that's what I, why I wouldn't like, you know, to use that word in what we're trying to do. Because we're just that's the narcissism constructs a false a false image, a false self, a, a total ego really, a complete a complete image. It's not the narcissism of 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 uh, of of the Greek. It's completely different, even though you know it's so yeah, so if you if you look at narcissists looking in the Pyrrhean stream, uh, the so what Wagner is doing is the same as Hitler. It's it's okay. Like shout out to Kevin here. It's a very fucking Jewish thing to do. So, so the and I, I mean, what, the reason why Hitler and anti-Semitic thing is at loggerheads is they're the alien cortex butting heads. It's that it's, it's you know Jewish self-loathing, loathing of Hitler, Zionism. They're all a nexus of the alien cortex. So, so the so what this very Jewish thing to do is 
is what he's what Vaknin's doing. It he's he's um, like you say the false image is projected back from the audience. So what what Hitler everybody thinks Hitler was projecting evil onto the audience. No, they're in a folie de. They're basically jerking each other off. And so he's he is riffing off them, they riffing off him, and they go and it, it's they enjoying, and it's not entirely bad. Okay, that's going to get me hung, but it's not entirely bad. They are celebrating God, so they're kind of discovering themselves in God. Why it's dangerous is again, it's too small. They thought God was Germany. It's like hey, a little too too small, guys. You know, if you get if this is such dangerous work. That if you make a fucking close miss, it fucking turns into World War II. That's how bad the stuff we're talking about is. So, so they write, they're celebrating the self. It's just then they went and cocked up because they said the self is bloody Germans, and the Zionists are doing the same thing. They they are having a you know a religious experience with the self. But what the bastards have done is that the self is Jews or the self is Zionists or the self is Germans or something. It's like, no, don't do that. The other guys will come and sort you out. Because they're saying like, what, every, what the allies are saying to Hitler is, you, you God, fuck you. What am I, chopped liver? I'll show you who God is. And then they come streaming in and trance Hitler. <laughs> You say, if one person stands up and says, I'm God, everybody else is, they also God. See, Hitler couldn't give everybody their divinity. But he was yeah, right. He had a fucking religious experience of Nuremberg jerking off the self. <laughs> then they went and qualified the self. Oh, no, that is like a road accident waiting to happen. <laughs> but people are genuine. People aren't genuinely going to be able to get past that, and unless or until they have a genuine. Yeah, I don't the, want to the, use the, the word experience. I don't, I don't. I don't want to use. Eh? I don't want to use the word experience. With, with, with Hitler, Hitler should have broken that cycle. He had the. He actually had the knowledge. I think so. So he was being irresponsible because because he actually knew what he was doing and the crowd doesn't know. So it's like Vaknin. He's, 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 it's basically deviant because Vaknin also has the knowledge and he knows what he's doing. So it's kind of evil from that point of view because Vaknin and Hitler should stop it. They, they have the knowledge to, they're in control of the situation. So if you want to lay blame, it's, it's with, it's with the, the guy on the podium. It is correct. But it, don't mistake what's happening. They're celebrating ourself. They're celebrating ourselves with a capital. Can I go S. back a little bit? Do you, Hugh, do you mind if I go back to a little bit yeah, earlier in the conversation yeah. to the more spiritual point? Uh, it's extremely easy to muddy the waters, I think, by talking about this this kind of thing. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering whether a person. At, at a certain point, it's better just leaving it all alone and not thinking about it. You can't. There's no. There's no option. The, the, you see, you can. You can go and hide. You see, already, Gary, you're fucked. I'll tell you this. Not hide. Me. Not no, no. No. Not not no, hide. But, you, but just no, be. No. No. For other people. For other people. You, you know what I'm. You, you got to let me speak because you know what I'm going to say, but other people don't. <laughs> okay. So 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 so. You're fucked, Gary, because you you already at the stage you're at, you could go and find the deepest mine shaft in Nevada or go and sit on the highest mountaintop or go into some fucking cave in the Himalayas and already some fucking ass would find you out. You, they will not leave you alone already where you're at. They will find you out. So so you're stuck, man. There, there's no you – can't, you, can't, you can't go and hide in a – you can't, basically, you're in a position where you can't put your light under a bushel <laughs> anymore. I mean, not you shouldn't. I mean, you physically cannot. You you could spend the rest of your life trying out. It's basically Forrest Gump or whatever. The, you know, basically, he's just doing his thing, trying to jog, and the people, they get it. They basically, they know Forrest Gump is onto something, and they want it. They want in. So they start. It, it, it's like Monty Python. It's like you, you are already Brian. The guys will run after you going so like, 
it's a sign from Gary. <laughs> They'll hold up your shoe. <laughs> so you're fucked already. I think everybody on this call is already so fucked up. They're already in the life of Brian movie. Can I ask? Can I ask a question? When you were talking about people who are maybe awakened but don't know they are, or haven't maybe had the the spiritual uh, teachings or basis for the for for, for realizing, um, uh, can it happen um, to people at a very young age? I mean, in the teens. Uh, a te that's, when it, that's when it primarily happens. So it's, it's okay. it was a tribal initiation, right? Yes, we've, we've we're talking about 14, 15. Uh, that is... That, uh, that's that's yeah. pretty much where... Yeah, in my case, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a youthful thing. Yeah, it's a youthful yeah. thing. See, that no, was... Uh, well, well Ramana, Ramana Maharshi was 16, I think, uh, at the time when that it's happened. It's a very, very good age for it, yeah. So basically, there's, there's a point where you you have plasticity of the brain and um, you you also can can have the knowledge but we this is one of the reasons why our society is making a monstrous mistake infantilizing the kids and keeping them in pubescence extended pubescence is if you have a look even back to the time of Benjamin Franklin. I think Benjamin Franklin, he already had a university degree and already, he was basically, I think he was like 12 when he graduated. You know, I mean, it was, uh, I remember when I was a kid, I read these Midship and Hornblower books and I was fascinated because I was about 10 and Midship and Hornblower, he's, he's like 12 or something and he's on a, you know, British warship, man of the line, and he's got serving men underneath him, a hundred serving men, and he's doing all the shit. And he's fucking twelve. He was only a couple of years older than me. And the, the difference between our society, where we infantilizing kids at twelve years old, kids were twelve at twelve were men. Hugh, but, but the better yeah. example. It's a better example. It, it is when you that that uh, fellow. Uh, that you spoke of, the who did all the uh, fighting in Chile and uh, liberated the the, the country. What was his name? A little while ago, you did a post on him. I can't think of his Ch 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 Cochrane? Cochrane? No, Cochrane. Oh, Cochrane. Cochrane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. But this, yeah. That story about Cochrane's getting on his battleship sets out to go to battle. His five-year-old son has deliberately stowed away on board the ship to go and help his old man fight the, the battle. And he's on deck with the – and this is a kid who's five who, who's seen – they were quoting things that he said in the article that I read. Like this kid knew exactly what he was doing at that age. Yeah, if I was in charge of – yeah, if I was the Tsar of the education system, I would stop high education and this regimentation and shit. It's basically, it's just evil. What what should be happening is uh, kids sh uh, should be with their mom until about, well, we're talking males here. They should be with their mom till seven. There's a crucial change at seven because it's kind of the age where you can make it in a tribe on your own without mommy. And, and at the age of seven, they should go into the workplace with daddy. So basically everybody who is working as a wage slave in a cubicle or something is you should have your son there showing you <laughs> a guy should be showing the ropes. But, uh, you know, this is only recent because up until I mean, I grew up in, I mean, I was born in the late 50s. So I grew up. That's what people were doing with our ch the children, whether male or female. Um, you were at 12, 13, you, I, I, you were either I, going with your dad at work and mother and you'd be quite grown up at 13, 14. You'd be uh, quite, yeah, quite yeah. Uh, in, you know, aware and, and be able to survive, uh, actually, uh, at that age. But there's been a big shift since. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny, it's, you it was, mm. it, it's funny you say that because, because I, I was, um, my dad did that with me. I, I mean, from the age of nine, I was sitting in business meetings and stuff um, with him in his high-powered business meetings. He he was a senior. Oh, I can't dox myself. But anyway, he was a big wheel. And uh, he took me into work with him in my holidays. But then I'd go, you know, back to school. It's like the schooling is a complete fucking waste of time. Well, they're not teaching you anything. What they're trying to do is just in, it's socializing. They call it socializing. It's not. It's making you obedient, making you productive, 
cog. It's basically it's dehumanizing. It's not socializing. And the aim is to make you stupid, obedient, compliant, and productive. It's it's a sin. What we putting kids through school, it's a fucking sin. Where, where they should be, you see, if if they were at the age of seven, they went into their parents' workplace, they would get a proper education for the job that they're going to do. They're being undereducated, being taught by strangers, and basically, you know, basically, if you talk about abuse and, sh and sexual abuse and stuff that's happening in the classroom, you're fucking lucky. You're fucking lucky it's so mild. It's, it's an intolerable situation. I don't, the, the fact that people set this up mean they're nothing short of criminals. Just just find the people that made the system, take them out and sh shoot the fuckers. I mean, they, 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 basically, I agree. The, every moment of child abuse that ever you saw in the news, blame it on the guys that set up these school systems and set up. You know, kids are not supposed to be in those barracks. They, 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 they are switched. They're supposed to be in the workplace with their parents learning. They're supposed, the to, they're supposed to go through initiations that are so, I mean, so instinctive and and that we know they exist because they've replaced them with all sorts of token things like communions and bar mitzvahs and whatever, all those. But those those ages, those crucial initiations that happen at puberty and under the under the guidance of the elders is is completely is completely disappeared yeah but that's can why i jump in for a second if you can awaken at an age at a propitious age in your teens you need to have this period I, of yeah. initiation and presence with adults that teach you and initiate you at that moment not strangers not Very strangers cool. you know blood yeah. relatives but exactly or people Hugh, can i can i just uh can I just say something about Sophie's point there? <clears throat> that um, uh, the, the uh, little story I told you about the traffic accident I was involved in, and um, I, won I was also wondering uh, whether that was a self-created initiation because I'd never had one. That's could what you, I was implying. You, it, That's what I was implying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You create. I mean, I didn't want to. You created it. it. Some kind no, no, no. Of, I, I mean, I'm, I I'm, you know, I'm aware. It. I'm aware. That's my interpretation. Yes, yeah, you, you, as you yeah. created your own initiation. Yeah. yeah, I created it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I have thought well, that. All yeah. young people create the initiation. They're starving yeah. for it. Um, look what they're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all these are are are, are opposed towards a, a form of initiation. It's it's. You can decrypt that through all sorts of games and and things that they're doing. Even yeah. the gaming, the gaming uh, online, uh, everything has just got this kind of, uh, you know, attaining <laughs> level and getting out. It's 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 there. Oh, and when I'm you're so lucky enough to have, it, to, to have been initiated young, you can you can reap a lot of things when when the occasion comes along in your life for an awakening. But if you are not, what happens? Well, yeah, I'm sorry to say this on a live forum, but this, you know, if you go back to Columbine and you have all these guys endlessly, you know, Michael Moore and then all these, you know, meh, violence and fucking Jordan Peterson is weighing in and they all, why does this happen and stuff? And I'll, I'll tell you why it fucking happens. You didn't fucking give them the initiation they needed. So they did it themselves, you fucking idiots. If you don't fucking initiate the kids properly, take them through the value of the death, have the death of their childhood and re-entry into adulthood and rebirth, a spiritual rebirth, they're going to do it themselves with a fucking machine gun. They're exploring death on their own. Go and look at the guys in Columbine. Look what they wrote. They're exploring their own initiation without any fucking guidance. And what do we have? We have fucking psycho psychopath psychopathic psychologists that are absolutely clueless and they're not guiding them. They don't have the knowledge. They're fucking charlatans, the lot of them. So they, uh, so then what happens is if, if, it, if the guys have potential for good spiritual awakening, then they become the kids at Columbine that shot everybody. If they just lesser, 
beings and they can't really do a good initiation. They're just problem children. And what these guys do is they get them and they just basically lobotomize them with, um, with all these, uh, these medications. So they, instead of giving them a proper ritual, they just fucking drug them out to, to control their behavior. In, in, in other words, they just turn them into walking zombies because they don't know how to initiate them and they don't know how to in integrate them into a slave society. So first of all, the slave society is wrong. You see, one of the reasons why they won't do a proper initiation, if, if you're thinking now, oh, Hughes just told you the solution to Columbine, you can run out and change the education. No, you can't. The first thing you'll find is they won't let you do proper initiations because you will destroy the slave plantation. They, they can't initiate people because they are free. If they go through the initiation, when you tell them now you have to go to work, they'll tell you to fuck right off. And that's why they can't, they can't initiate people. It's, it's basically, it's, the system depends on this uh, uh, you know, lack of initiation. Because it doesn't need, it can't, again, it can't take free people and it can't take people that behave randomly. It has to have obedient, mechanical people. And so it can't afford to have free people because otherwise you just won't be able to exploit them. So you can't run off and change the education. You have to change it wholesale from the top down, starting with the knowledge. And that's what we're doing on this call. Doing, basically giving you the knowledge so you can't go and take it and take one piece out of the system. You can't run off and say, oh, I've got the clue to the healthcare system or something. This is what guys in XR do. They're going like, you know, we can do it piecemeal. We'll fix this and fix that. It's like, no, you're thinking again in procrastinate frames. It's like there are no frames. That's your alien cortex. And the thing that are making those little frames, that's the villain that needs to go. And there is the lesson. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, I always just want to read this comment. Someone said, if every eight-year-old in, in the world is taught meditation, the world will be without violence within one generation by the Dalai da Lama. No, but hang on a minute. Well, what's your... What's your okay, now, no, no, <laughs> now you can feel bad. <laughs> okay, they're not teaching you meditation. Go and watch my video. They're teaching you uh, prisoner self-administration. They're teaching you self-control. So wait. Watch, watch the video I did on meditation and said, you know, you think you know meditation. Well, that's the wrong kind when you just said that. It, basically, we are not out for peace. They want peace because you're a slave. They want a peaceful workforce. So they teach you how to do self-control. And that's what this fucked up non-meditation is. The meditation they don't want you to do is Raja Yoga. So if you go back and look at the proper yeah. yogas, Wait a second, wait, wait. It, it, so if you go back oh. to the proper yogas, but basically it, Raga, Raja yoga is yoga for a king. It's a yoga to make you into a king and to make, so, so that you're not obedient and not peaceful. This idea that it's a relaxation technique and to keep you down and stuff is to keep you down. The cheapest way of keeping you down is to get you to do it to yourself. So what you're saying, what that quote that comes from the Maharishi and he was selling snake oil. Right. And, oh, here's another uh, quote or um, comment. Transcendental meditation can lead to awakening, awakening and experience of non-self. But I know you, you have a different opinion to that. You, it, it transcendental can, meditation. They're going to you, right? It, 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 as a blanket statement, that's, that's true. Especially if you say transcendental meditation. It means you transcend. But... They're gonna they they're tricking you. They're saying, oh, I'm gonna teach you transcendental meditation. They don't. They teach you a way of being subservient, and it's often subservient to the guru. So basically, what happens next? You go and have a look after you've done the meditation and that. You're in a pyramid selling scheme, and you'll sell people their own endorphins, and basically somewhere along the line, this is gonna be in the newspapers because somebody's gonna like you know demand their dick sucked, and then it's gonna turn into a bad headline. And that's where all of these things go. So yeah, those guys are they they getting scalps. They they don't want you to be free. And one of the yeah. techniques is teaching you self hypnosis. So so be careful. 
Transcendental okay. meditation, they will teach you self-hypnosis. And one and then and then it's doing a couple of things in terms of the cult. In terms of the cult, it's it's giving you a differentiator. And it's also what is going to happen is you're going to find a few, get some good results. You're going to get your endorphin levels up and stuff. And you're very likely to get uh, one of the results is people will start adulating you. You'll start getting people coming up to you and saying, ooh, you're making progress in this. And you start to have a you say, oh, am I? And then you start realizing you have power over people. And the next thing you know, they basically got a fucking aura around your head and you exude peace because you realize everybody goes, ooh, he's got it. I want some of that. And then eventually you're selling people the peace, but it's their own endorphins and, and, and building up this ego that now I'm a spiritual teacher. I'll put an orange towel around my neck and you know, wear the ochre robes. And, you know, and then, and then also I, I'll give you a few hints if you want to pull this trick. It's the easiest fucking trick known to man. Lower your voice a few octaves. So basically now I am your good if you listen to the words of lord hugh you can reach a point of enlightenment but keep your voice low because it says I am the one with the serotonin. I tell your monkey brain, I am calmer than you. This, my children, it means to your primate brain that I have the most serotonin. If I have all the serotonin, I am the boss. And I show you this with a low voice and a calm attitude. And then you give me lots of money and lots of praise. I get more serotonin because serotonin is not a democratic hormone. The guru takes it and you give him more and then he fucks you in the pussy. <laughs> That's how the trick's done. Ta -da. Oh, Hello, I'm, I'm Rojo. I, am, I am the rich man's guru. Who the fuck knew? <laughs> All right. Oh my God. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> if you wanna, oh, here's one more comment. I don't know if you want to go here. Um, someone's asking <laughs> for thoughts on Therav Theravadan Buddhism, direct teachings of the Buddha. So, so everything the Buddha says is like immaculate, right? He's on the <laughs> The problem is, it's gone stale on the shelf the minute he said it. The minute it's written down, right, it's lost its spontaneity. Uh, and it's it's tending again towards, it's, it's stale fruit, right? If it's not said in the moment, if you're reading it off the written page, it's written by an alien cortex. So at, it's kind of like remembering a joke after the audience has left or something. You know, it's like, it's a bit... Late. It's not appropriate to this to the situation. When the Buddha said that, he said it in the moment, responding to a moment that you cannot now capture on a page. You can only just guess, and people are going to guess it wrong, and they're going to just interpret what he said in terms of his words, right? And so, you can't take the words of a page and then basically get enlightenment from them. It's actually pretty dangerous shit because what people are doing see it's all these kind of clever quotes and witticisms and stuff and that they're not good and the the reason is that people say all these wise sayings and then people feel good and then go back into the trenches so it's kind of like the doctor's 
bandaging up people to go back into the front line so they can perpetuate this dysfunctional system. So people hear all these, you know, wisdom from the Sufis and stuff. And then, you know, you, 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 you um, what's the Sufi guy? I can't remember. The wonderful quotes from, I can't remember. Rumi. 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 Right. So you get all these Rumi quotes and then everybody like quotes Rumi and then, and then it, Rumi is a fucking, well, Rumi is Rumi, but, but quoting Rumi is not cool because people need to find their whole existence and our society absolutely intolerable to the point of complete rebellion. If you're doing Rumi quotes, everybody's going, oh, yeah. They're like you're giving them these little pills, they're little blue pills all the time, and then people go back into their dysfunctional life. It's not, it's not really going to anything, and it's not doing any good. It's just these little sugar pills that are making people feel better. They shouldn't be feeling better. They should be feeling fucking miserable, especially in the world we live in. But you I think, Hugh, there's... there's... And so be careful about the Buddha. If, the, if you were studying the Buddha and it makes you feel better about the world and this existence, well, it's like, nah, -uh, man, that's fucking unhealthy. If you're in the world we're in today and you feel chipper about it, you're, you're fucking deviant. You're well, of course. Oh, uh, here's the response. Um, Theravidin Bo Buddhism is a collection of teachings on how to meditate. How else do you reciprocate these teachings other than through the alien cortex? You have to, but you see, this is why what the guru is doing is a bit of snake charming. So you're basically keeping the alien cortex occupied here while basically you do surgery on the other layers of the brain. So a lot of the stuff, you see, this is the power of an arg. Basically, people go like, what the fuck is this? They can never get hold of it. They can never pin it down, never put it in a box. So while the alien cortex is tracking, trying to find what the fuck, whether it's Arthur or Martha and stuff, it's busy. While it's busy, then the guru can get in and like quickly rearrange the feng shui of all the, <laughs> the layers. But as soon as the alien cortex realizes what you're doing, then it'll put up its guard again. So you can only do it for, for so long. So, uh, so unfortunately, you know, you can see from a point of text, it doesn't doesn't help you because what you're going to do the surgery on yourself. It's difficult. Yeah. Um. Can I can I budge in there because I know Gary wanted to say something and I'm I won't be long. I'm never long, but we had this conversation with Gary yesterday and we we talked about some of the some of the things we discussed, like uh, you know, uh, awakening and what we were talking about for the last couple of hours. But there was also another thing that came up is. You describe, Hugh, uh, the experience of um, awakening close to a, a temporal lobe epileptic fit with energy um, ascending and, you know, all these things. But we're thinking you're describing it from a from a male point of view. And uh, is it it would be interesting. Maybe we won't have time today, but maybe in a future meeting that we could explore um maybe because i i wouldn't be able to talk about it much but i the female side um the differences uh the you know the, i know you're a man so not talk I mean, no, so this is, i've been delaying this and delaying this but it's coming from so many angles and people are asking me yeah. this from so many angles and i dread this fucking bite but okay no but that's the, fine no, no, I, I know. I just have to get over myself and do it. it, it so, so we have to cover this territory. And I've been no, it's, uh, it just is not the, urgent. It's, I'm curious more than anything oh, no, else. It's, it's, it's time. It's time. I'm getting the signal from a number of things. I tell you, one of the things that I in, in my book that I was writing, uh, I, I've got to the stage where I have to start saying stuff about gender. And we're in the middle of a gender war. And I'm telling you, I'm completely overwhelmed because I, I, I don't know how to even begin to approach this uh, from a point of view of political correctness. It's, it's very, very hard. I for think we, can forget, I think we can forget political correctness in our group. I mean, I know we record this and we post them. But to be honest, I think we wouldn't be here if we were worried about PC. 
Oh, yeah, but I, I mean, I'll lose half my audience as soon as I start. Ah. Well, we can make a closed a closed meeting between us on that, if you prefer. Yeah, but this is, this is where we've probably got to take this inner circle thing a bit more seriously and just uh, do it there. Well, that's the kind of line I'm thinking is, like, should we... Inner make circle. It, you, you see, I'll tell you what happened in the, in the cult I was in. They split two streams, and they basically they would teach... You got to a certain stage, they'd split in so that you would have male and female streams, and this is why. I, I'm toying with <laughs> the idea of of a not splitting. I would like to do a, it's an experiment, really. I'd like to see what happens if you don't split it, and and I would like to see double. Maybe I'm overreaching, but do it in public. It it has the potential to turn into a violent train wreck. But I feel like we should, I should, yeah, we should try. Maybe we should. Maybe we should try and do it. And do it. But yeah, the, it, it, this is where it gets really exciting. So I I did tr start down this path, and I started down with things get really powerful really quickly here. I started down this path with Hank, and we took Greta <laughs> because that is a really good starting point. <laughs> Um, we got into, you go and watch, the, if you want to start on down this path, go back to those four videos, because I, I was starting down this path. I didn't get too far down this path before Hank blew up. So here's the, the, part of the reason is, is Hank and in his personal situation, he's married with, with kids. So you can't go into this without you know involvement with spouses if you if you if you're a guy you know with your wife or your partner or something if you're heterosexual and if you uh, if you're with your husband and if you if you heterosexual but but um, you know it'll leak it'll leak into your personal relationships and, and from my point of view, you, you have spouses come in for your head, or the opposite. In in Hank's case, um, his wife really liked the stuff I was saying. But you see, off camera, then people have to go and talk about it afterwards, and it's going to get in the way of your personal relationship. So you know, it's it's. It's not going to leave a personal relationship intact. If I just keep it like it's been going, then it's just you. But the innocent parties being involved, if you start, if I start down the, the track of the female experience. So, yeah, I just want to lay the groundwork. <laughs> you're asking, it's not, it's not ter it's territory. I feel we have to do in these times. It's just like the fucking end times, and you know, you've got to draw back the veil. The problem is that Can you... drawing back the veil is, is is kind of an illegal move from, from the female point of view. I mean, no. I mean, okay, I'll give you a taste of it. We've got so fucked up that that you have to say that we're in a patriarchy. It's like my answer to that is like whatever you say, ma'am, you're the boss. <laughs> we're not in a patriarchy, we're we're in a matriarchy. The, the women rule the roost. But it's, as soon as I start talking about this, women instinctively and evolutionary from an evolutionary ground get will get very, very defensive because I'm exposing their game. And basically that's not good from even an evolutionary point of view. The, the game women are playing is basically they all know what they're doing and they're playing it in secret. But, but I, 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 I don't, to talk about their game is not permitted. In, but in, I, I got lit alive for saying that in the country where I live, that some stage a lot of prop, a lot of mental problems were due to the matriarchy. I got literally lit alive, and I was say, "You're a woman," but I mean, I'm not. I, I think every culture has got its differences, so we can't. We don't know what we're talking about when we talk about matriarchy. We have to look at different different parts of the world and. There's, it could be a very interesting to explore, but I tell you that I got it alive when I exposed mm -hmm. in a in a speech and a thing in a public 
uh, the roots of alcoholism and in Ireland and uh, child abuse through the way mothers yes. were bringing up their sons, for example. And I were like, what? And, you know, and, and the power and the power behind and all these things. It's, I, I know what you're talking about. You're going to make a lot of people not happy if you go there. Well, well, well you're going to have to carry your weight because you can say shit that I can't say as a woman. You're licensed to say a whole lot of shit that I can't say. But the just to, to give you a flavor of it, like, I mean, I think like Gail Bradbrook comes to mind on this. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to God on a limb here. Uh, clearly, she's got daddy issues. She keeps on talking about her, her father, and her father was a minor, and, and you know, she's in, on and on about the fucking patriarchy and stuff. And it's like, Okay, this is a personal issue. You can see it, and I can guess there's some fucking shit that's going on with the father in a dark room somewhere, and you know you got to work. Now, if you start talking about matriarchy, patriarchy, and all this kind of thing, that's the territory you're in. Basically, people have daddy issues, and uh, you know, uh, and the, the 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 dominant. The dominance in our society between males and females is often being perpetrated uh, by rape uh, on women. And so, you know, you're in that very, very charged territory. And like, yeah, but uh, you're, you're in a charged territory that doesn't look at the obvious. Um, the, the, the first, the, the, the mother, uh, which are majority, uh, is with the child in. You know, we're, we're a species that is born non-finished and uh, not like our friends, well, furry friends. When the little baby comes out of his mommy, he's symbiotically linked to his mother for a year or two before he can even individuate. And uh, not, mm. not mentioning feeding himself or walking or everything, cleaning himself. So the mother is, is so important in the first year or year and a half or two years. And denying denying the power even i'm not saying matriarchy in a in a in a negative way it's a fact it's just a fact do you know what, what i mean where, where it comes becomes difficult is is whether it should be a matriarchy or not and it should i i believe it should be a matriarchy i mean i i believe the woman should be in charge but it's it's straight away it's difficult because you know we live in a slave culture where psychopaths are in charge and so you know in some ways gail's uh, rebellion against the patriarchy she's rebelling against psychopathy and but unfortunately what she's saying is the woman should be in charge and what that translates to in the language of our society is that actually the woman should be the psychopath <laughs> so like no the woman should be in charge but not that way you know it's like uh, let me give you an example i've said i've said this before but i don't think anybody believes me is if you go back to victorian times the women were in charge it was a fucking matriarchy all the way up to queen victoria it was a solid maiden britain today the fucking died in the will matriarchy the women are in charge you go to britain and you like the guys can say what you want but they've got no balls so you basically you say anything you you see what's decided in a room the women fucking decide every time if if it goes the man's way then they'll shut up if it doesn't go the man's way, fucking hell, <laughs> those sparks will fly. It's a matriarchy, the woman in charge in Britain. But the, uh, yeah, so, so, but uh, you're not allowed to say that. You have to say the men are in charge and say, well, you're, not, you're missing the point. In the Victorian era, the men were in charge of all the material goods. The women didn't want the vote. Why? Why go and sully your hands and dirty your hands with money and politics? It's like, let the fucking man do the dishes. So they would send these guys out to the empire. All these, you know, English women are such fucking bodiceers. They sent their man, men out to the far corners of the world to bring them back goodies. Your men wouldn't have done that on their own. It did it because of the fucking woman. They set a very high price on their pussy. They said, basically, to have my British pussy fucking conquer India. And Robert Clive was like, 
Yep, absolutely. And he was off to India and basically getting goodies. Why was he getting all those goodies? Because then he could go and uh, he'd get a nice woman. And so, so the woman created it. They created World War I with white feathers and stuff. But you're not allowed to talk about that. It has to be World War I was created by all these guys who didn't give women the vote and stuff like No, they didn't need the vote. The, the vote was cheapening their power. It was basically getting their hands dirty. They had, they had more than the vote. They could just basically scowl at a man in Victorian times and he would wither and fucking go and conquer Egypt. So it's like women really lost it in Britain till eventually they lost control so much that they're on par with their fucking slaves. Now when you go into the, the women are competing on a level with their fucking male slaves. It's like, how, how did you lose touch, you stupid woman? You should have kept control. So what, what we're seeing now in Britain is a complete loss of control and you know it, it's degenerated into this uh, feminism and you say like boy you got to get your skills back girls i'll tell you why one of the, the reasons why the girls have lost their skills and this is a subject which gary and i talked about recently and maybe we should leave that for a day but but yeah the, the women have lo lost their skills because um of the way girls are brought up now, and particularly sex and what we're allowed to, uh, you know, basically the pedophilia and stuff has is, is ruined uh, the, the upbringing of girls because it's put a chill on in a huge distance but and an uh, artificial reality between men and, and girls because I tell you, in America and Britain, not so much in Europe and Greece and stuff, but in America and Britain, uh, girls are not able to explore their sexuality with men anymore because there's so many taboos. And I'll tell you that in Britain and America, the, the men are petrified of being pedophiles or being, you know, uh, being caught by the law. They're basically men will not touch children in in Britain and America for fear of basically repercussions with the law. And they're not they're not idle threats either. They're very real, um, basically threats that they face. But the net result is that for for a young girl, uh, she can't experiment with things like sexuality and stuff, which are completely natural. And so, so yeah, uh, so girls are, are growing up not learning the skills of how to manipulate men because basically the, the law said, you know, you know, go near a kid and you're a fucking pedophile. <laughs> like, and so, yeah, I mean, and then we have this denial of childhood sexuality. It's basically in America, we, even according to the law, it's entrenched in law that kids are absolutely asexual beings. And then whichever state they're in, they reach the age of majority and consent. And basically, if it's Alabama, it's, it's, like, so, like, it's totally it's ridiculous, gone. isn't it? It's just, it's yeah. just so ridiculous. But but basically, you get to you get to us in any blue state. You get to 18, and then there's supposed to be a big master switch that goes on. Hello, you're now a sexual being. Hello, and basically, sorry about all the uh, sex ed and stuff we gave, gave you, but sex ed in in schools in America is just uh, Puritan scaring them to shit with sexual diseases. They're just trying to scare the kids into abstinence. And they did all sex ed in, in America is the sex ed that I saw my kids getting. They just petrify them with, you know, STDs and all about this. STDs, STDs, STDs. And make like, you know, sex is the, what they're communicating is sex is dirty, sex is evil, but is sex you'll get AIDS, um, wear a, a condom and basically fear, 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 sex, sex, fear, sex, fear, sex. And it's a Puritan thing to stop you breeding. And they want to stop you breeding so that you'll go through college before you get pregnant. And then basically you'll be a productive slave. So the, the I had a totally different upbringing because I, I, France is at, at the antipodes. In my right. time, I, the Me antipodes. Too. So it's, yeah, uh, I've seen it in England though, because I've got half of my family who's English and I could see the Puritan in print. They are right, uh, but it was it was the 60s, 70s, so it was a bit different. But yeah, but, but it's, you, what you get it, out it, of that it's changing. It's becoming like that now in but, Europe. But you, 
it has you, you been. You, what you get is 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 like woke and me too and stuff. And the reason is because this pretense that that kids are not sexual beings that doesn't allow them to explore sexuality. So eventually, when they are exploring sexuality, it, it's taught to them by psychopaths like Weinstein and stuff like that. So they they you know they learn all the wrong cues. They don't have uh, you know basically. Girls are experimenting with their sexual power and their magic from the age of four. They they realize that they are attractive and they start experimenting. Three, yeah, three, yeah. So so they start experimenting and stuff. And what happens now is they they completely ignorant about what they're doing. So they come to a man. It can be especially because we have so such blended families now. And then you know you might be stepdad and or you might be dad. And, you know, your daughter or your stepdaughter is going to come to you as a man and basically she's going to experiment with sexuality. Now, men are not taught how to handle that. It's basically our society just has a complete taboo over that whole area. So the net result is the man's completely freaked out and he thinks, bloody hell, the social services are going to be banging on the door soon and basically I'm going to be a pedophile. So, you know, in those situations, the man freaks out. And now think of what that does to the girl. She doesn't know what the fuck's going on. She just knows that she's got some little power and she's exploring it. And she seems to be, you know, have this mesmerizing power over men. And she knows it has something to do with her body and the way she moves and what she does and stuff. And so she starts experimenting with that. And immediately the guy says, Stop that! Fuck that! Fuck all you! Because he thinks like I'm gonna go to prison and have like electrodes attached to my penis to give me inversion therapy for children, and you know he his head explodes and he runs out of the womb. Well, imagine what the little girl thinks. She thinks, "What the fuck? Am I a monster?" She thinks like, "Is my body so fucking ugly that like this guy just head blows off and he runs out the room?" And she she feels you know introverted, and the next thing she knows, she's got bulimia and she's got all these body issues and shit like that. And then what she finds is, she, because she isn't allowed to explore sexuality in this safe environment, she eventually she starts to get low self-esteem. And by the time she is exploring sexuality, it's with some fucking predatory psychopath like Weinstein. And so what those those guys have realized is the same as Donald Trump that grabbed them by the pussy. You go and look at that video. What Donald Trump does is a power play. You see, psychopaths soon realize that these girls don't have any skills. And so what they realize they can do is they can shock them and get control over them. So the very first experience they have is a shock experience of, of sexuality. And then the, the very little vocabulary we give girls for interpreting that. And so the, they have to grasp for some kind of label, and it's usually rape or something like that. But... What what these uh, what it means is they can't have a natural sexual relationship. Their first relationship will be with a power relationship with some psychopath who's really felt his way around the situation and profited from it because they're looking for victims, and the law made a victim out of a little girl because it wouldn't allow men to have a proper you know sexual exploration. So what we should be telling, we should be explaining to men and boys, get first of all, get the fucking law and the social services and get them out of the fucking picture, the psychologists and all these guys doing witch hunts for, you know, anal penetration, paranoia that went on in Britain and the baby shaking shit that went on in America and stuff. Get that shit out. Get that fucking out the picture. That is completely fucking everything up. What we need to be doing is to explain to to men and and boys that that girls are sexual. They will come onto you. They will strip for you. They will. You will be amazed. What? And now this is stuff that guys can't even talk about to guys in the pub. They can't even talk to their mates about this and share information over a drink. It's so such taboo. So the net result is the well. What it means is that the the girl then uh, is shocked by the male response who's just thinking of the law and the cops coming in and social services and stuff and what we should be say, saying to men and boys and say say you know you're the boss in that situation this little girl is going to explore sexuality with you and they, and it's 
you know, it's never going to go anywhere to yeah. real sex or anything like that. It's just an exploration. But she's going to take intimately the cues that you give her. So you've got to be trained to give the right cues, to, to know this is natural. And I'm telling you, the easiest way is, is to just make a game out of it. It's, it's the game of love, and it's the game of life. And you have to, you know, smile. And, you know, it's, it's so easy to handle. If, if you saw an example of it being handled, everybody would know what to do. But, you know, the, the way is you, you know, you just smile and laugh and say, oh, you nerd, naughty girl. So like, oh, you sexy when you do that. You know, it's, a, you know, it's basically, uh, and then make her feel good. Make, make her say, yes, that's, that's the thing you've got. But the man is in control of that situation and think, what are you teaching her the skill? And, uh, you know, it's, uh, the other, uh, is, so make a game out of it and make it, it fun. Give it, you know, it's basically teach her the art of love. So, you know, imagine you're, you're Romeo and she's, you know, doing something obscene or something, but she's trying to be Juliet and then, you know, make it into Romeo. And when she does that, she'll say, oh, you know, ah, oh, my beauty, you cannot compare. And, you know, do, do a fucking soliloquy. And then, then she feels like, so. Uh, one more thing I'm saying on this is those incidents are very short-lived. So one, one thing that's freaking guys out in that, they think, oh, you know, she's taking, you know, she's doing a striptease in front of me. Uh, this is going to end in like, you know, um, it's going to end up like a video on like what, what's the fascination these days of like um, incest. Yeah. So, the, oh, it's gonna, so we're heading for incest porn and the guy freaks out. But it's like it's not going to go anywhere near incest porn. So the, the little girl doesn't know where it's headed. It's like she, she doesn't know that's the destination. It's got not going to wind up there. So the so there's not so so it's very short lived those those incidents. The little kids will do basically flirtation and stuff like that, and then they'll get bored and fuck off and do something else or go play with their dolly. But they'll pick up immediately if if you try and divert them or change the subject or the, they in those moments they in exquisitely keyed in to your response. Basically, this is this is reproduction and life and death. So they evolved to be hyper attuned. So you can't do something like saying, "Oh, this is awkward. Uh, get out the dolly. Let's go. Let's go and do something else." She'll know that you basically diverted from the situation. And you got to think, you'll see it in her eyes. She will go and she'll go, why did he do that? And you better fucking hope that she doesn't get the message, does he not like me or something? You better fucking hope that's not the message because you just fucked up your daughter's life in that moment. But we, we're not allowed to say this stuff. We're not allowed to get up in an open forum and even go here. So it's like, and it's tragic. It's the, the tragedy of the world. Well, thank you so much for saying it because I've been saying this thing on my own for so long and I'm a woman, but as a, on mm. the sexuality of children, like trying to demystify this, this oh yeah, uh, everybody who has kids knows that children masturbate, like at a very mm. young age. And when I used to have patients coming to see me, oh, I'm awful worried. You know, my daughter or my son, it never stops going to sleep. And I'm like, I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, you know, you have a big problem. You have a big problem because you're coming to a doctor to tell them that you're worried because your your children are masturbating at at the at, as babies, well, at three, four, you know, or, but it, and and they don't know it's normal. Uh, you know that a lot of people were incarcerated, and I, I think no, I don't know if it got in the DSM, but uh, traditionally, a lot a lot of people thrown in mental homes um, and had their lives completely re re ruined in the Victorian era. The, the 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 case notes that said what they were being committed for was masturbation. So. Yeah, it's about yeah. So anyway, it's uh, we we opened we opened basically we cracked open the barrel on this one. <laughs> so well, I mean, it's really three it's three hours since we recorded. So 
I was wondering, yeah. could we not uh, yeah. go back yeah. onto the that's, gender that's, and that's all like these things maybe yeah. next time? Because it's it's yeah. extremely yeah. interesting. And yeah. I'm really curious since I spoke about it with Gary, because I was wondering if a lot of the good advice that you give us and a lot of guidance that you give us isn't is it male centered or is there some variance that you would like to explore for a woman path to follow do you know i'm thinking more in that line than just what we know about genders most of them are most of us are on the same um on the same wavelength there but more precisely in the process of awakening and in the process of even what we're talking about all the time which is crushing the alien cortex and you know i'd like to see if they can be a female um aspect or is it just that you're I, saying you know, it's I, like I think I, I should try i should try and do that in a yeah. in a mixed audience yeah i, I yeah in the past this Here, was can I, can I... Uh, in a unisex audience but i think i think you know since this is the fucking apocalypse we should we should give it a go yeah here, the point I was making, uh, talking to Sophie, was um, uh, just my limited education regarding the traditional Chinese view of the, the, the different sexual energy systems of the male and female system. Um, and uh, I, I don't know whether you might want to take something like that as a starting point to, to because they were very tuned in to um the, the the spiritual use of sexual energies um and of course the indian system as well yeah which you're probably more familiar with i guess um but that might be the starting point to do with the in fact to deal with the whole female issue because it's a, it's a point that's not socially contentious you might be able to begin there, work up through the spiritual significance of the, of the energy systems, and then when we've established these fundamental differences between the way male and female systems work, then gradually bring that out into the social issues and the psychological issues. I Yeah, I, I think it wouldn't work because I think it would be boring as fuck while you talked about yin and yang. And eventually, everybody would be snoozing, and we would go along the line, and eventually get across a line where we hit yeah. one of the contentious issues. And then suddenly, somebody would woke up and say, "What the fuck?" And there'd be a fucking explosion, what? and what? people would. Go, I think you've well, suddenly got to contemporary gender war, and it's like then there would be a bump. No, up. but you see, you, you've you've already put the cat amongst the pigeons now. You, you put the cat amongst yeah. the pigeons now. You know you, what you've yeah, just said you, tonight you, is you already. You can't, you can't just creep up and get no. get to the contentious point with, with the, without having the basically you're just wasting time creeping up. By the time you got to the contentious point, everybody. No, was, but the but the but the point is the, the spiritual the, 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 the spiritual energetic connection is still critically important. That it's worth it's worth presenting anyway, regardless if you yeah, whether you want to use it as a way to creep up or not. Yeah, but it's it's academic. So the, the basically, I'd be um, preaching. To the no, I was the, putting. The <laughs> I I I, I feel no, that if not... you take that route, I put the alien cortex to sleep, and eventually somebody's mammalian brain would wake up and explode, and I would be like, "What was yeah. the lead-in for? You should just get get to the explosion." <laughs> yeah. No. All right. Um... I don't think you can creep up on these things that way. I well, maybe. I mean, the psychologists do that. Well, they, I think if you put it around the pussy, but they're on the clock. They 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 basically getting money. No, they get but you see, we, we, if if you pay me by the hour, it gets I'll that forever. No, but I was thinking more on this stupidity where you see that oh, women can do anything, and and. Uh, well, well, I'm I kind mean, of in agreement. I think people that. have to <laughs> understand. Like women can do anything. <laughs> hey, I know who's boss. Yeah, at but very, at the end of the day, for this is uh, this is for the men. It's like do what you fucking like. Death, death is sibling, man. You got to submit to death, and she's black and she's female. <laughs> you better, you better fucking lay down and die properly for her. Uh, Hugh, remember that. Oh, go ahead, Gary. What you're saying is more important. I was just going to make no, a joke. No, no, no. Uh, thanks. I, I, I just uh, 
Um, no, sorry, I've lost it anyway. You might as well go ahead. Go, go oh, ahead. Uh, okay. So I was just about to say, remember that that image I linked to the lioness and it said, yeah, yeah. So he knows what I'm talking about. The lion, you know who I'm talking about. Lion, <laughs> lioness isn't submissive. She only lets you be king as long as it pleases her. <laughs> she she is the divine beast. She is the divine beast. So, but that's that's how it appears for for men, heterosexual men. Um, it is the same for for women, but it's only for the the anima, right? The the animus. So it's basically, the the woman's animus and anima is basically, it, to some extent, the w women are representations of Kali in the flesh. So there's there's kind of nothing to teach them. <laughs> they, they kind of know it. We just kind of you see. What Kali is doing in a, in the modern world is running rampant. So you can go and look in the Bhagavad Gita about Kali running amok. Now Ka Kali uh, is running amok now, and that's the difficult thing to talk. Really, when I say about the mammalian's brain head blowing up, is is Kali is running amok. It's the female aspect of us running amok in the world. How Kali was was brought to sanity was by Shiva. And particularly by by Shiva laying at her feet, so basically Shiva submitting to Kali was what calmed Kali down and stopped her destroying the world. So you know you can't reason with a woman. <laughs> Don't clip, take that clip out and take it out of context. Just but, lie at her feet. That's okay. Lie at her feet, yeah. You got to lie at her feet to to calm her down. But but she's she's gone nuts, man. Is she, yeah. <laughs> she, so so women just just to round off here, women created civilization. It were if if you t you you'll see uh, if I put posts on on examed if I say anything about anti self degrowth, anything anti uh, some, a woman will jump on my head. Because you know what what they think I'm saying is you know they'll be condemned to a perpetual camping trip from hell for the rest of their life, <laughs> and so they they react. They, women want domesticity and they created us, but we we're drowning in the domesticity. I, I think we could discuss that maybe next time. But I mean, yeah. I don't think uh, I don't I don't know. Is it? I mean, I think you're maybe generalizing there, but I think that. Women are oh. getting infected. Oh, it blew up. Oh, it blew up. Bang. Women are getting infected as much as men by now, so it's very hard to know where where to draw the boundary between who is defending civilization and who's not, who's maintaining it and who has interest in it being maintained. So we, we it would be an interesting um, spot to start discussing that next week anyway. Oh. We got quite a... I, I be I'm I'm just getting a bit tired there, about oh, yeah, yeah. and yeah. my brain is starting to show signs of, um, I don't know, like I I can't concentrate anymore on what you're saying. Yeah, well, well yeah. If, if, if we should do three hours for another fifteen hours, and then that would yeah. be. <sighs> And I'm starving. Uh, and oh, so, yeah, yeah. We're just getting into the good bits. And you, and uh, you so. <laughs> Keep it. Three hours. We, let's try to go for 24, man. Come on. Come on. Okay. Well, anyway, I'll let you off the hook. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> How magnanimous. Yes. All right. <laughs> Carly. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I, I love <laughs> Carly. Oh, you know, man. Ah, got you. <laughs> uh, not me, man. You, Carly. Oh, get it right. Sibley. <laughs> you, Sibley. Sibley and Carly are the same thing. Guys, you better go and have yeah. something to eat. He does the latest thing. <laughs> And maybe something okay, mom, mom says, right. quit the book. Mom says it's time I'm to good. go to bed. <laughs> mom says it's time to go to bed. You're the boss. Okay. Right, good good boy. Good boy. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks, you. Thanks.